Mr. Chairman, we are live. Very good, thank you very much. Uh, welcome everyone to the two of travel recreation and wildlife cultural resources committee. Uh, September 25th. Doing a, a huge thank you to Co Chairman Miller. Uh, I'm not sure if we're, we're going to have another meeting. Thank you. If we're not, I would. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Very little of what you're saying, uh, Chairman Driscoll. Here's what he's done for the wild house in the state of Wyoming. And so uh, my thanks and our committee's thanks. Wow. Um, I mean, it's kind of break up on Well, Chairman Miller, I think it's up to you to uh, <laughs> pat yourself on the back. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? I, I thought it was my computer breaking up, not not uh, the co-chairman's. No, I think it's him, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, go ahead. No, I don't have anything to say other than uh, I believe the ball has been thrown into your court. Well, uh, I think we'll give him a few minutes uh, to come back on. I don't know uh, what will happen. And he may be at home at uh, Devil's Tower, and the connectivity must not be too good there. Um, so let's give him a few moments uh, to regroup. And if uh, if if he doesn't come back, then we'll we'll proceed here in a few minutes. This is an awful way to do business. It's a, like a first grade uh, computer program. Only half of it works. Most of the, everybody's words are broke up. Yeah, this is this is a sad way to do it. Am I breaking up or can you hear me okay? For the most part, we can hear you, Chairman Miller. You're breaking up a little bit, but not bad. Kind of like yesterday. Well, well, I kind of shut everything down uh, everywhere I could. Uh, that was a, a recommendation from Representative Flittner, and I appreciate that. But I don't know if it did much good, but uh, it, I'm trying. I've got the phone shut off. I've got the TV shut off, uh, all that stuff. Maybe try some tin foil okay. on your head or something. That might help. Yeah. <laughs> I, I see. Uh, I see. Co-chair Driscoll is back on the bottom of my screen. Um, you know, John or or uh, Mary Beth, is it possible for him to join the phone if he's got a bad internet connection? Mr. Chairman, it is. Um, it's possible for, possible for anyone to join by phone um, if they're having technical issues. It should the number that the number and passcode is at the bottom of the invitation, um, and I can okay. resend that if necessary. Well, let's see. I'm just checking to see if he's emailing me right now. I don't, I don't see anything. I'll send him a, a text and see uh, see if he responds to that.
Okay, we'll see if he responds to that. I see him down there at the bottom of my screen. Oh, he just disappeared again. So, uh, Mary, did we roll a second day? Seems like we have sometimes and haven't other times. Uh, whatever your pleasure is, Mr. Chairman. Well, this this go ahead and take take poll, and we'll get that in stuff whether we need it or not. Uh, I know we're going to be missing a couple of people today, at least one anyway. So, this go ahead and do that. Senator Anselmi Dalton. Present. Senator James. Here. Senator Moniz. Here. Senator Wasserberger. Who was that? Senator Wasserberger. Okay, excuse. Representative Edwards. Here. Representative Fleener. Here. Representative Freeman. Here. Excuse. Oh, there he is. Representative Haley. He's excused. He's not going to be with us today. Representative Newsom. Here. Representative Tass. Here. Representative Winter. Here. Representative Yin. Here. Co-Chairman Driscoll. Uh, he'll hopefully be here in a few minutes. So excuse at this point. Co-Chairman Miller. Present. Okay, uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll turn it back over to, to uh, co-chair if he shows up. And uh, on our agenda today is the Wyoming Gaming Commission. And Mary Beth, do we have Charles Moore in the room? Mr. Chairman, we do. Okay, let's go ahead and proceed. I'm back. Hopefully, this, can you hear me better now? That's better. Okay. Where are we at? I assume Co-Chairman Miller took over, which either way is fine. We, we, we waited for you a few minutes and then uh, we went ahead and convened and uh, we just introduced our uh, Charles Moore of the Wyoming Gaming Commission for his presentation. Perfect. Welcome, Director Moore. Oh. Morning, Chairman Driscoll and Chairman Miller, committee members. Thank you. How would you like me to proceed? Can everybody hear me? I'm seeing oh, yeah. the thumbs up. Uh, Thank you, Senator James. I, I, I can hear you, uh, uh, Mr. Moore. I believe Co-Chair yeah, Driscoll, are you there? Well, thank you, committee members. My name is Charles Moore. I'm the executive director of the Wyoming Gaming Commission. Legalized gaming has grown from a limited activity to one that is extremely commonplace. Gaming in some form is now legal in every state except Hawaii and Utah. In Wyoming, gaming is prohibited except in certain circumstances. The following forms of gaming have been legalized in Wyoming through an exception tribal state compact or changes in state law. The lottery, tribal casinos, Calcutta wagering, charitable, social gambling, skill-based amusement games, and paramutual wagering. I am pleased to report to you that our summer season has just completed and the paramutual wagering activity and the participants at those events um, have been extremely positive this year. We saw an increase in participation in wagering handle and licensing. Additionally, we are seeing a recovery in wagering activity at the off-track wagering locations throughout the state. Initially, after COVID-19, we saw a 2% drop in wagering activity. We are now seeing those climb back to um, 2019 numbers. <laughs> Other updates that are exciting for us that are going on is we just completed permitting a new operator. So now we have three permittees in the state operating that will be in 2021. And that'll bring a total of 50 race days to Wyoming for next year. It's very exciting times. That's gonna help the horsemen and our state's agriculture industry. Skill game rules. 
Just at the meeting yesterday, we presented our first draft of the skill-based amusement game rules that we've been working on. We will continue to work on those rules and work with industry leaders and participants to fine tune those to where we can get those out sometime hopefully before the first of the year into the formal public comment. <clears throat> We're also pleased to report the current skill games are now reporting their wagering activity electronically. While we know that has been a, a tough push for some of the operators that are out there with the skill games, but we've just recently completed that um, just over the last couple of days. Uh, and our experiences that we've had with the skill game operators that we currently have has been very positive this summer. <clears throat> Additionally, in the next few months, we will have our first draft of the rules for bingo and pull tabs and the process for licensing bingo and pull tab establishments in Calcutta is moving forward and we'll be focusing directly on those now that our racing season is completed. It's just exciting times. I am glad to see that you are having technical difficulties because in our meeting yesterday, we had several technical issues, but we had a very good meeting yesterday of the Gaming Commission. Um, we were able to move a lot of initiatives forward. And like I said, it's, it's exciting to have a new operator in the state. Um, hopefully it'll go well. And uh, things are, in my estimation, are, are going quite positive. <clears throat> um, committee members, if you'd, uh, I do have my senior accountant here with me today to report on the wagering activity, whether it's uh, the historic horse racing or the skill-based amusement games, um, any of that, I can sure have him go through that for you, or we do have our submissions and the gaming report that does have that listed. Um, it's your pleasure, committee members. Chairman Driscoll, would you like us to go through the, uh, the wagering activity reports or, or how would you like to proceed? Yeah, I'd like you just to continue on and then we'll go into a question period with the committee at the end for you, with you. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Steve, um, I'd like to introduce Steve Dobby as our senior accountant with the Gaming Commission. Steve, if you'd unmute your uh, microphone. There you go. We're not hearing you, Steve. At least I'm not. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, it's better. Thank you. Welcome, okay. Dobby. Well, th thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Co-Chair Miller, um, Co-Chair Driscoll, the uh, historic uh, horse racing terminal handles, um, as re reported in the report for 2019, we did a little over 7.93 million in total handle on the historic horse racing uh, off-track betting facilities for both operators. In 2020, as everybody knows, um, those were shut down for about a month and a half. Uh, the latter part of March, April, and then the beginning of May, and then they were able to reopen. So our total handle uh, through July 31st, 2020, um, starting January 1st, was a little over three, uh, $353 million. It's 353 uh, million, 204,376. So we're projected by the end of the year to be down a little bit in handle, but not uh, as much as I thought we would be with the COVID, the, the OTBs are, are up and operating again. And we're almost back to the weekly handles that were established in, in 2019. So things like Charlie said, are, are slowly starting to come back and, and we're pleased with the wagering activity at the historic horse racing terminals. Um, as far as the, the, the games of skill, uh, those open, you know, they're open up for operation in May. Um, I can give you an update on those numbers. We, on the skill-based amusement games, uh, we've raised over a million dollars in tax revenue. The first million dollars goes to the gaming commission account. And after that, uh, we keep track of, of the revenues that are produced at each location. And we will disperse those funds at a later date. But 
as of uh, not last week, but the week before, we have brought in almost uh, $1.3 million in tax revenue from the skill-based amusement games. And like I said, the first million dollars goes into the gaming account. And then, so we have over 300, almost $300,000 uh, at this point um, that has been raised in revenue for the counties, the cities. A portion of that goes into the uh, education fund. And then the last little part of that goes back into the gaming commission. So we're very happy with the games of skill, their handles. We're, we're bringing in on average about $72,000 in tax revenue a week um, from the games of skill across the country. And that should get you updated on our, our two major areas that, that uh, produce revenue, the historic horse racing and the games of skill. A simulcast activity uh, is up and, and going again, and the operators are talking about expanding the simulcast activity. So I, I, would, I would think that we'd be raising more tax revenue through the simulcast uh, activities across the state. Both operators are trying to advertise that more and, and get uh, patrons to come in and, and bet on live races at other tracks across the world. I can uh, go into this in greater detail if you like, but those are the, the, the numbers for historic horse racing and the skill-based amusement games. Does anybody have any question on those two key areas? Any questions from the committee? Uh, Senator Salmi Dalton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Davi. So I know you said it's not projected to be much down year over year. I just didn't know the first figure <clears throat> from 19, was that just through July as well, or was that for the full year comparison? That's for the, yeah, that's for the full year. Okay, so what are you expected? I mean, has it picked up through July and August? I, I did actually go out to one of the racehorse um, events recently, which was fun, and um, saw a lot of people. So what, how, where do you expect it to land, I guess? and Because it's done now, as I understand, the historic horse racing um, is over in Rock Springs, at least. Well, that's live horse racing. That's different from the historic. Historic are the terminals that are at the OTBs, the off-track betting facilities. And so that's different from the live wagering. Um, so the historic, we take the handle that's raised at all 17 locations across Wyoming uh, for the day. And so the numbers that you're looking at for historic horse racing are from those off-track betting facilities. Okay. It, it does not include the live horse racing uh, wagers. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Thank you. And Mr. Dobby, how is it going for the live horse racing comparatively? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, it was down a little bit, but near the end of the season, uh, the wagering on the, uh, the, you know, for the live horse racing was about the same. I can give you the numbers. Um, in 2019, between both operators uh, at, the, at the horse track, at the live horse track in Wyoming, uh, it was about $1.6 million in total wagers. And these 2020 numbers are preliminary. We just wrapped up our racing season, but for 2020, the total wagers were around 1.4 million in, in total wagers. But a lot of, <clears throat> that just counts the wagers that were placed at the track. Uh, as you know, things have progressed. People can, can place wagers in many different ways. They can, they can place a wager on those, uh, those races and not even have to be at the horse track. You know, they can bet through simulcast. They can also bet through what we call advanced deposit wagering. And I won't get into great detail, but those numbers are up. So I think overall the live horse racing was about the same, which uh, it took a tremendous effort, but getting those, you know, those horse races to take place and getting people to, to come to the, to the racetrack and having to test everybody. So I'm pretty happy with, with where we're at with the live horse racing down a little bit, but not as much as I thought it would be with the COVID-19. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one quick question. Sure. And uh, maybe this is for you or maybe um, Mr. Moore is the question, who's the third operator now that he said there was an extra operator that's coming to the state? I didn't see it, maybe I missed it. Uh, yes, uh, and thank you. Uh, Senator Dalton, we, we do have a third operator. We have Wyoming Horse Racing, which is operating the race meet in Rock Springs. We have Wyoming Downs that has the race meet in Evanston. And then now we have 307 Horse Racing, which was permitted yesterday 
to operate the horse races in Gillette, Wyoming. Mr. Chair, follow up? Follow up, sure. All right, one more quick question. Just who owns these entities? Are these, I've heard sometimes that it's coming out of Vegas and I'm just curious if it is out of Vegas, are these all Vegas entities? Are they owned by Wyoming people? I mean, can you answer that for me, Mr. Moore or Mr. Dobby, please? Uh, Chairman Driscoll, Senator Dalton, um, you know, it's um, their group, it's a partnership group. Um, and, and I can sure give you those that all that information. And I know you've asked that of me at one other time and we can sure follow up. Um, one of the ownership groups um, is a combination between a Wyoming person and uh, Chicago based. Um, the other group is, is out of Las Vegas, but also other parts of the country with their management here in Wyoming. And then, uh, then the other, the final one is strictly a Wyoming based company. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Moore, I did ask for, and I do wanna know what I wanna know the percentages. I wanna know if we're just making money for Vegas. I wanna know how this is working out for us in Wyoming. I'm very, I've asked about it and I'd like to have that information for the whole committee, please. Chairman Driscoll, Senator Dalton, I'll have that to you later on this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? Co-Chairman Miller. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is for either uh, Mr. Uh, Dobby or Mr. Moore. Uh, the historic horse racing has had a, a spending of $353 million for the year to date, I believe. What's the net taxes that came from that $350 million? And that's the first question. Uh, second question is on the skill base. Uh, please, uh, Mr. Moore, remind us uh, what the expiration date of the skill base uh, skill based gaming goes away. I believe that sometime this year, or I believe next year, without any legislative action. So, uh, those two questions. Thank you. Chairman Driscoll, uh, Co-Chairman Miller, I can answer the latter for you for sure. Um, that would be July 1 of 21, that sunsets. Um, the, your first question, again, Chairman Driscoll, Senator, or uh, Co-Chairman Miller, uh, Mr. Dobby can maybe dive into that, if you wouldn't mind, Steve. Yes, thank you, Director Moore. Uh, Co-Chair Miller, and Co-Chair Driscoll, the way the, the tax structure works for the historic horse racing, um, as you said, there's that 353 million, how, many, how, how much in taxes were raised. Uh, the state gets a one quarter of a percent of that total handle for taxes. And for that period of time running through August 31st, um, that amounted to 883,000 and, and $10 and some change. The other part of that, another quarter percent of that handle goes to the uh, legisl legislative stabilization reserve account. And of course, with a quarter percent, that's $883,000 in change. Uh, the third portion of the tax structure goes to cities and counties. And um, the way that works is if the OTB is in a city, and of course, it's going to have to be in a county, uh, it's split. Either half a percent goes to the city, half a percent of that handle goes to the city, and half a per of one percent goes to the county. And so, for cities and counties, uh, up today or up to August 31st, uh, we've raised uh, $3,532,043.76. And like I said, that will be split between the cities and the counties. And the last portion in the tax structure goes to what we call the Breeders' Award, and that, that goes to the, the live, you know, the, the people that participate in live horses, horse racing, excuse me. And we, that money is used um, in purses and other areas. But for the breeders, what we call the Breeders Award, they get four tenths of one percent of that total handle, and that amounted to one million four hundred twelve thousand eight hundred seventeen dollars and some change. So those are the four key areas uh, in our tax structure on the historic horse racing. I hope thank that answers you. your question, um, Co-Chair Miller. Thank yes, you. thank you. Further questions. Representative Newsom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a question on the skill games. 
you mentioned that there is a million dollars of that money that came out. I see on page 20 at of, of the um, handout that you provided us that it references that $1 million. Can you describe, is that $1 million just sitting in an account um, to provide cash flow, or does that account grow with this set aside? Chairman Driscoll, I can uh, respond to that, Representative Newsom. Um, that is sitting in a state account um, with, we go through a and I um, division, and that is sitting in, a, in an account. So yes, it's, and, and we're now working with the uh, auditor's office and the um, a and I accounting division on the distribution of those funds. The, the funds are, are are held in a uh, account very similar to what all of our accounts are held in with the state. Did that answer your question? Um, follow up, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, kind of. <laughs> does that account grow or does it stay the same? I mean, do you kind of always have a million dollars in that account for emergencies or whatever? And then from here going forward, since that account is funded, then the whole amount goes to um, to pay the state. Is that how that works? Chairman Driscoll, um, Representative Newsom, again, another good, good question on that. Um, basically, the accounts that we have, we have our operating fund account, which is our 049 account. We then have a 515 account, which is our Breeders Award Fund account. Then we have another account that's the 514 fund, which is the city and county funding account that we draw on. And then we have now the 695 account, which is the gaming account. Now the gaming account, um, at this point, we are not drawing on that account. Um, that would have to go through a B11 process if we were wanting to draw from that account back over to our expense account. So we are not. It is basically just a, an account that, that is growing in interest um, and we continue to, to feed, so to speak. And then each, each um, every six months, we will drain to the million dollars the tax revenues that go to the city, the county, and then also to, it's, it's continually appropriated out of that to those different entities. Thank you. And, and just as a follow-up, Senator Driscoll, Chairman Driscoll, um, the skill-based amusement game tax structure is on page 20 and 21 of the gaming report. Also, the historic horse racing tax structure is on page 17, or excuse me, on page 18 um, for you, Co-Chairman Miller. Thank you. Any further questions? Senator Meniz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Charlie, I just was curious, uh, as far as the skill games go, have we weeded out all the illegal ones across the state? And have you got this certification down to a science? Or how's that going? <laughs> Chairman Driscoll, Senator Moniz, it's been an interesting process. And, and thank you very much, much for asking. Um, Yes, we currently have 10 permitted operators in 306 locations um, across the state. That includes um, three game types, and, and we're, we've been working quite well with those. Um, we, we did deny some, and we have, we have some games that we did deny um, due to their noncompliance, um, and there, that's, some of those are in ongoing um, issues that we're working with. But, you know, all in all, I've, I've been very pleased with the current permitted and licensed uh, operators and uh, games in the locations. We are doing routine inspections. I don't have the numbers in front of me. 
um, as far as how many inspections and audits we, or reviews we've done of each one of those locations, but we've been very actively in those locations across the state. As we move forward with this, we are going to look into utilizing um, uh, the Department of Revenue to assist us with some of our um, compliance checks um, with those games in the same locations. I've had several conversations with uh, um, the director of the Department of Revenue, Mr. Noble, um, about doing that and working with their uh, compliance people that are across the state. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm very pleased. I think we do have it down to uh, somewhat a science, possibly. Um, and so it, it's been a good experience now. It was a heavy lift. It was a, a tremendous lift uh, for that first 60 days, but we got a tremendous amount of, of cooperation, not only from the skill game people, but also from the attorney general's office working with us and uh, everybody in our staff here at the agency. So. Well, so follow up, Mr. Chairman. So is the law, law enforcement community uh, pretty good with, with the way things are working? I mean, do they respond to complaints and can they, I assume every one of these are certified, have a stamp or something on them. So there's no doubt to a law enforcement officer, whether it's legal or illegal, when they uh, respond to complaints. Chairman Driscoll, Senator Moniz, again, another good question. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I believe so. We're working very closely with local law enforcement, um, chief of police, um, sheriffs, um, also with DCI um, across the state. With this, each machine is stickered. It has the required Bucking Horse logo sticker on the sides of the machines. Those uh, have the, the serial number, plus they have the um, operator's name and phone number and contact and the agency contact numbers on those. So when law enforcement walks in, they can look and see that they're stickered um, very similar to what we have done always with uh, historic horse racing as well, having the stickers on the machines. So I, I do think um, that that part's worked well. Um, and we do have, uh, we do have some ongoing investigations that we've been working with, with law enforcement on games that uh, have not qualified in the state, so. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions from the committee? Further questions? Very good. Uh, that wraps up that. I think the, the next agenda item before we go to public comment, we'll go ahead and uh, move into the technical corrections part. Are you ready to visit about that, Director Moore? Uh, yes, I'd be, uh, Chairman Driscoll, yes, I'd be more than willing to do that. Thank you. I think we'll go ahead and go right into it then, and uh, then we'll do public comment after it. Then we can kind of roll them together. One of the, uh, Chairman Driscoll, if I could have a, could I speak? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I didn't know if um, before that, if you did want to go through the gaming report briefly, I would be more than willing to screen. I would like to do that and I would encourage the committee to read it. Uh, Director Moore told me about it and sent it to me and I kind of shelved it and I pulled it up the other day and it answers 90% of the questions. It's a very well done report. So yes, if you would, I would very much appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, the gaming report, as required by House and Roll Act 95, was due uh, September 1, and we delivered that to Management Council and to your committee, along with uh, several other individuals. Um, you know, I, I am pleased with what we have here. It, it is quite lengthy, um, but one of the, the things that I would ask you to do when you are reviewing it, um, take the time and look at the attachments. Um, a lot of the attachments due to the size of the report, we, we place those in uh, Google Docs and to where it links. And a lot of those reports then are, are there for you. All of them are in fact. 
and uh, makes it, you know, very extensive. Um, the report is designed like any report, at least my, my understanding of most reports, uh, it will create a lot of questions. Um, it will um, give you a lot of options uh, when you're looking at the types of gaming. Um, gaming in uh, North America is, uh, as you look at the report, the types of games, the type of gambling that can be done, it uh, sometimes is, a, is a quite, um, well, it, it's, it's a lot of stuff, I guess, just to be very, very simple about it. Um, one of the things that either I can screen share with you, or um, I don't see if I have a screen share option here, but there is an interactive map that is linked in the report that I would strongly recommend uh, you, you taking the time and looking at that. It lists out um, all of the skill-based amusement game locations. It, all li it also lists out the locations for the historic horse racing. Um, again, it then lists, breaks it down to the live racing locations in the state. And I do see that I do have the ability to screen share now. Um, if I can get to it. I'm not sure if everyone can see this now. Um, there. Are you able to see it? It is up now, Director Moore, thank you. Okay. You know, I, I, it's a, like I said, it's, it's quite interesting. It is broken down here in this screenshot um, by counties throughout the state. But over here on the, the left-hand side, you can click down and we'll first populate the live racing locations across the state. And then you can, and, and you can refer to this at any time. This is live document. It's dropped back off, Director Moore. Excuse me? The, the, the screen share has dropped off. We're just seeing your uh, background on your computer now. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. I apologize. <laughs> As you can see here, what I've done is populated the live racing locations around the state. Then we can add into it the off-track wagering locations that we have in the state. You're able to zoom in, look at the locations, see where they're all located in different parts of our state. You can then populate the, um, the games by manufacturer, the first one we'll populate are the Gracie games that are across the state. You can see they highlight in, in uh, green here. We've got the group of them here, here, and then down through this side of the state on the east side. Now we'll populate with the bank shot games and they're primary active, primarily active down in the south eastern part of the state. Now we'll fill it in and complete it with the pacematic games that are in the state. So right now we have all gaming activity that is under our purview. And then if you add in the tribal casinos, you'll see that activity in the center of the state. And then to throw in one of our major product projects that we take care of is the Wyoming Red Program. This is uh, this populates where all the horses are throughout the state in our Wyoming Bread Program. Our Wyoming Bread Program is currently one of the strongest programs in the United States. Last year alone, we distributed three point two million dollars to participants in that program. Uh, we have people now moving to the state for the Wyoming bread program that are housing their horses. We have several farms. 
uh, across the state. They're housing horses for people from other parts of the country that are keeping them here year round, breeding them, raising them, paying for their to be taken care of, and then raising those horses here in Wyoming. And it's all because of the historic horse racing, and it's all because of the Wyoming bread program that has been so, so successful now. That is um, as far as the gaming report goes. Um, are there any questions at this point on this? Mr. Chairman? Charlie, where do we, have you got a link on your report to that map? Yes, there is. What it page is it on? On page 14. Okay, thank you. You're Charlie. welcome. Charlie. And there's also a, a tutorial right below that on page 14 that explains how to uh, click on the different locations and, and drill in and, and do that. Excuse me for being not quite. Uh, for all of you, this is the gaming report. I'm going to scroll back to the first page of it, if you don't mind. And are you seeing it on the screen now? We are. Okay, thank you. Here's the first page of the gaming report. And, and again, I, I would encourage you, I, I will go through this fairly quickly because some of this we've already gone through. Um, there, there's some very interesting links to this. Um, on, on these pages here, you've got the regulatory overview of games and types of gambling that are going on in North America. We have several pages of that here. We have sports wagering, the types of wagering activity with sports wagering, the allowed type of wagers with sports wagering. Um, this is kind of interesting. Um, the the uh, link that's at the bottom of this page is where we got this information from. But this is just showing you in the United States and North America and Canada, um, you know, how much gaming is going on online. Um, and, and it's, it's quite a lot, as you can see from this shot. Of course, land-based gaming, the different types of distributed gaming versus the casino type gaming. Distributed gaming is something similar to the video lottery terminals. Um, it's, a, it's similar, it's a, it's a route type gaming. And again, it explains what it is. Again, different game types, whether it's slots, class twos, lottery, or traditional games. Um, this is an important screen here, you know, the importance of good sound regulation. And we're, we're very fortunate, the people that we work with, with the, whether it's the historic racing side of the house or the skill-based amusement games that we're working with currently, um, they understand the importance of, of good regulation in, and with, with good regulation, what you find is if you want the wagering activity to increase, it will increase. Uh, as people develop the confidence in the gaming activity, um, the wagering activity will go up. And we have quite a bit of links that are attached to everything. Um, you know, this graph right here, we pulled this from the Oxford Economic Study, just shows you the economics of gaming in a state, um, the positives with that. But always with, with gaming, there is that social implications that go with it that you have to be very mindful of. And, you know, with any expansion in gaming, there is that social issue that does come with it.
This is the page here that has the interactive map on it. Again, in the gaming report that was submitted to you, it is on page 14. Um, last year we had on the historic racing, we had uh, um, Roger Coppola at the uh, University of Wyoming Agriculture and Applied Economics um, did a study. That study is linked to this report as well. Um, it was a very interesting study that he did. The bottom line is horse racing does have, and the historic racing is an int intricate part of our Wyoming economy and the three live racing facilities, simulcast historic racing as well, and the industry is an important factor in the state's diversification strategy as framed in Endow. We have a tab here with the skill-based amusement games. Um, we go into the timeline, our phase one of the project. Again, like Mr. Dobby said, um, this, this was done as of August 2nd, but it translates into, uh, we've had over $3.8 million in net proceeds, which translates into, again, in, as, as of this report, $763,000 in tax revenue. Um, the governor signed the bill March 17th. We implemented uh, phase one. We had 60 days to basically qualify um, all of the, the games that were in the state. And <clears throat> like I said, we have now uh, 800 and some games, 306 locations with 10 operators. Here it gives you a, a bit of a comparison. Wyoming has a 20% of the net proceeds, Arkansas is 18%, and then Virginia charges a $1,200 per terminal per month. Mr. Chairman, I have a question there. Ch Charlie, how does that compare? Charlie, how does that compare uh, the percentage the percentage, like 20%, 18 to the 1,200 a month per terminal. You know, I, I haven't looked into that to, uh, um, I guess I'd have to get with Mr. Dobby to, to look at that. We can sure follow up with you on a comparison between um, a flat fee versus a uh, the percentages and we'll do that, sir. Thank you. Dr. Moore. Uh, I have a question as well. Can we get a uh, comparison sent to us of the percentage paid in taxes, uh, apples to apples between the skill games and the historic horse racing games so that we can see the, the actual percentages that are going back because we got them rolling in now. So we should be able to, to calculate that. Can you do that for us? Uh, Senator Driscoll, yes, I believe we can. It'll, it'll take us just a bit of time, but um, one thing I'll always bear in mind, the tax structure that we do have for historic racing is based on the handle, um, which is the total wagering activity and the tax structure that we have um, with the skill-based amusement games is based on the net proceeds. But we can come up with some comparisons that, that we'll drill down, uh, hopefully, and, and give you the information that you're looking for. I would appreciate it. And, and show the different layers on this story because it goes different places so that we can kind of get some direct comparisons of how they are with each other. Absolutely. Thank you. I will. Senator James. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is kind of a clarification slash general question. And so I'm not asking for any changes on anything. I want to ask him for like clarification on why you guys pick and choose which type of gambling is allowed here because in my mind they're all gambling and you may or may not win but to me gambling is gambling why only allow some and not all um uh, chairman driscoll senator james i have 
you know, we're not the ones that have picked the different types of gaming. Um, the policies have been developed by the legislature and, and, and uh, you know, it's a carve out in the state of Wyoming. Basically all gaming is illegal except for the carve outs and the carve outs um, via the um, legislation is the lottery. We have tribal compacts, uh, then the paramutual wagering and our charitable gaming also. Thank you, Director Moore. And I, Senator James, you were there when we did the gaming bill. That was really what the guts of the gaming bill was, was to define where we drew the line of what was legal and what was illegal. And that will continue on depending on what comes for a bill up on the sunset is what's there. And it truly is exactly what Director Moore said. The statutes are clear. All gaming in the state of Wyoming is illegal unless otherwise permitted and the otherwise permitted he went through the list of them uh and that's a legislative prerogative to set that policy but what they but, do right mr chairman i'm just wondering if someone might be able to clarify for me on why that is what it is on why the legislature in general has decided you know these are this gambling is legal but this one isn't, but it's all gambling. You know, even the historic racing, you're putting money in, expecting to get more money out. That's gambling. What's, Senator James, you're directly correct, but if you remember when we did the gaming bill, that was exactly, amendments were brought to make them everything illegal. We went through the whole gamut. And right. what we ended up with um, is what was acceptable to the legislature in statute form. And that is now in statute. And for you, if you want to make them illegal, either you fight the bills or you bring another bill to take it off the table. No, I'm not wanting to make it illegal. I'm just asking on how this came about because it's, it's just very confusing to me on why. So I'll give you a very quick history on it. Uh, on each one of them. The tribal gaming, the state of Wyoming fought it and it handed down to us via a Supreme Court decision that the tribes could have gaming in Wyoming. So it's out of the purview of the legislature as a whole uh, and does it. The lottery was brought by a bill, I believe about 11 or 12 years ago. There was a specific bill that legalized the lottery. Uh, bingo, pull tabs and all of that were legalized long before I went in, maybe 20 some years ago for charity purposes as well as paramutual. Historic horse racing came, I believe about 11 years ago via a bill of Senator Schiffer and Sue Wallace's that legalized the historic horse racing. The gray games or skill games, whatever you want to call them, came in through a crack that they could do it and nobody prosecuted them and stopped them. And basically the gaming bill, which you were a part of last year, is what defined what would be legal and what would be illegal. So that's a layout of how the history came on it. And the truth is it's the same as any other statute. Uh, if you want to broaden it or narrow it, it will be done in the future through statutory changes at this point. Okay. All right, that, thank that you. Okay. Yeah, that helps. I was just it was just more clarification. I wasn't trying to ask for any change. I was just getting more clarification yeah. on all of it. So I appreciate it. Thank you. No, and we'll give you all the latitude in the world. We, we all need to understand it. The Gaming Commission study will help you a lot. It's pretty lengthy, but it'll help you understand it. Right. All right. Thank you. Yes. Chairman Driscoll, if I can follow up with Senator James as well. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. You know, I, I, again, that's... Um, I, I totally agree with you. Um, gaming is gaming in a lot of situations and gaming is similar and also a lot, some of, uh, you know, the, the liquor, uh, different things like that in the, in the United States has been all kind of carved out and, and done very similar to this um, all over the United States. So it is a bit confusing um, it's um, 
always been kind of restricted in a lot of ways in a lot of states, not necessarily allowing for the, you know, the fair market the, uh, uh, to, to really take over and it's always been limited. So I, I do understand your concerns. On page uh, two of the gaming report, um, on a, exhibit C, I have listed there all of the gaming bills that have been proposed in the state of Wyoming um, listed um, in that attachment, Exhibit C, since 2009. And it's, it's kind of an interesting um, document to look at. You'll see where it's kind of coasted along. Um, and, and then all of a sudden here this last session, you know, we had a pile of them come in, so. Representative Yen, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to highlight for the public and the committee um, that what Mr. Moore said on page two is basically the history that you laid out. So um, historic horse racing and uh, the lottery were both in 2013. Um, and the link for the gaming legislation is also a good history of, of gaming in Wyoming and what happened. Thank you. Further questions? I don't have, can't see everybody, so you can speak up if you've got questions. I've only got about four on my screen, so. Okay. So Chairman Driscoll, if you'd like me to, I can move on quickly through this. Uh, we touch on video gaming terminals, a little bit of the history of the, the video lottery terminals or video gaming terminals. And again, typically they're a small market type of a, a gaming activity. Typically, they're limited in statutes about uh, with the amount of wagering. And again, typically, they're limited in their jackpot. Um, it is a route type gaming um, to where they're all self-serviced around your state if you do have video gaming terminals. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it seems to be getting more traction in some parts of the country. Uh, here is the tax comparisons that we, we came up with across the United States and other states. And again, a little bit of history in different states. Regulatory framework, again, um, our regulatory framework that we talk about in this is um, a little redundant, but it applies to all the different forms of gaming. And basically what it's saying is uh, you need to have a clear path you need to have good foundation and good regulatory framework before you allow gaming to continue in your state. Sports wagering. There's a lot of different forms of sports wagering. Uh, this, the, uh, the uh, Oxford Economic uh, Report that was issued several years ago estimates that we have about $449 million a year being waged illegally from illegal markets in the state of Wyoming. So uh, typically, again, with sports wagering, you would be transferring, um, if you decided to authorize the sports wagering in Wyoming, you would be trying to pull those people from that illegal market into the regulated market. And for the most part, people are looking to do that. Right now, you can get on your phones and you can you can Google sports wagering and quite a few of the sites that do come up currently are the illegal markets that are out there. Again, we have some regulatory framework suggestions. You can see Colorado's taxation is 10%. Nevada is 6.75. New Jersey has a blended rate, whether you're online or whether you're not. Um, a tax rate suggestion for sports wagering is um, typically it's a higher volume uh, type of a wagering activity and you are, are trying to draw those wagers over from the illegal market. So you have to be very competitive with that market to get these people into the legal market. So 6.5 somewhere in there is, is at the low end of that taxation. Another thing that I, I brought up throughout the report, and, and this would speak to some of the technical um, changes maybe to our laws, uh, skill-based amusement games, you have to be 21. Uh, the paramutual 
is 18 and lottery is 18. So some consistency may be in order. Um, again, those are policy decisions. That's not my decision. It's just an observation from the agency. We also feel that whether it's story horse racing, whether it's uh, skill-based amusement games in our state, or whether it's sports wagering or anything else that you would you uh, would like to do, you know, we feel like all the licensees should go through continuing qualification requirements, including integrity and lawful conduct. Again, we touch on some regulatory oversight here again. Um, this map here on the left hand side of your screen right now, and it is in the gaming report as well. We, we condensed a little of this, but um, for the slide presentation for you. You can click on that interactive map and it will pull up the different tax rates from state to state for you. There's some very good white papers that have been developed there on the right hand side of the uh, of your screen. Um, the, the two top ones there, part one and part two sports betting were developed by Gaming Laboratories Inc. Um, we also have a white paper or two white papers there from BMM. Um, and then we have um, the economic impact from the Oxford study there as well. And then uh, sports betting policies from the American Gaming Association. Regulated options and considerations. Um, first off and foremost, it's your job, as you know, to set the landscape, to decide what the policies are. It's my job to read the statutes and interpret those and enforce the laws. Um, one thing to bear in mind, the, with COVID-19 this year, we need to be very mindful that the, the, the facts and the figures, while we need to pay attention to those with COVID, um, on the other hand, you may not want to base future economic plans on, on numbers you see here, up or down, because it, it is somewhat skewed. Some of the increases that we saw in historic racing, um, while it's difficult for us to, to know this for sure, has the potential to be affected by the closures of the casinos in Riverton and the people were going to the historic racing location. So, you know, we, we need to be mindful of that. We also need to be very mindful of the social implications, which I know you all will. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting market. We need to keep integrity and regulatory impacts in place. We need to recognize good regul regulation does increase public confidence and so on and so forth. Expansion of gaming in the state. Um, and, you know, I presented a couple options here for you at the tail end of our report. And they're not in any necessary order, but, you know, currently the skill-based amusement game, um, it's working. Um, there are some tweaks that we need to make to it. Um, we need to make some changes with it but it is, it is working and it's been positive. Um, you know, we need to clarify the definition um, of skill-based amusement games. And, and that's due to the fact is we have two definitions in our statutes. We have our definition that's in section one and then we have um, the new definite, a different definition that is in title six. Um, Continue and potentially, you know, and, and the reason I, I say limit the locations here in the report and limit the number of locations and the devices is as we ramp up the agency, um, we don't want to be chasing the football. We'd rather to be catching the football if we can. Um, and, and so it has been difficult with our small staff. Um, we do have hopes to increase our staff. I know that's tough times, but we are not generally funded. So hopefully that can work. Um, you know, option two, and again, I say in here, increase the, uh, the sunset for maybe one to two more years or 
The other option I didn't even put in there was go ahead and just make it legal and move on with some, some good changes. Um, option two was talking about VLTs and VGTs. Um, while they fit very well in the regulatory market and they're designed to fit well in the regulatory market, they do have um, direct competition with things that are going on and activities in our state that are currently working quite well. The skill-based amusement games and the historic racing. Um, if you did move forward, you would wanna do something very similar to what you have done with skill-based amusement games, limiting the dollar amount, um, the, the different and the numbers in the locations. And this is something that is very commonplace across the country with VLTs and VGTs. Mr. Chairman. Number three, I'm talking about the sports wagering. We've already talked about it. Go ahead. Sorry there. Charlie, would you expand on what VLTs and VGTs and all of these acronyms mean? Senator Driscoll, excuse me, Chairman Driscoll, Senator Moniz, yes. Um, back on um, in one of our earlier pages, it does have the definitions for um, VLTs is video lottery terminals, VGTs, and excuse me for the acronyms. I do apologize for that. Um, VGTs are video gaming terminals. And then SBAG is skill-based amusement gaming. And HHR is a historic horse racing. So basically, and, and to kind of to speak to, to what Senator James had said earlier, they're all gambling devices. They just have different names and, and, and fit into different regulatory schemes. A follow up there, Mr. Uh, Charlie, that you, you state here that it would be in comp direct competition with the existing ones. Uh, so are they operating out in our state now? Chairman Driscoll, Senator Moniz, no. VGTs, VLTs are not operating in the state that I'm aware of currently, no. So what you're doing is you're just, you're just suggesting an option to increase to these type of games? This is just one of the other options. And with, and, and excuse me, Senator Driscoll, or Chairman Driscoll, Senator Moniz, um, this was one of the options that it was asked in the report to, to review was video gaming terminals. So while I have you, Charlie, and then I'll shut up here, uh, the transition, I, I'm sure, has been a heavy lift for you, but how is the transition, the new gaming commission, going from what you're used to? Chairman Driscoll, thank you for that. Um, you know, it, it depends on the day, to be very honest. The, the transition has been good, um, The whether it's the... Um, the skill game people or whether it's the horse racing side of the house. Um, it's, it's been a, a good, I think it's been a good fit for everybody. We've been attempting to service everybody um, as we've always done with, with things. Um, it has been a lift. I've been very fortunate. I have to give credit to my staff. We're a small staff, we're a nimble staff, and I have to give credit to it. Um, you know, throughout this period, I have had some of my staff that have been uh, quarantined um, and affected by COVID. Um, part of uh, our, our issues early on, and I think you even asked me um, at the previous meeting was, how are you inspecting these locations and getting into them with COVID? Well, we were using uh, technology. We were using our iPhones um, and things and getting in these locations and getting these, these things stickered. It's been a lot of work. Um, it, we are in dire need of a, of a few additional people. Um, I, I list in one of the latter pages there, you know, with the horse racing increasing, um, with the skill games have the potential to increase and all the activities increasing here. You know, I'm looking at, you know, initially on a conservative side, two additional people, and uh, maybe a potential for a deputy director and then uh, some more accounting people. Um, right now, um, we are using basically old skill type uh, um, 
ways of, of collecting some of our data for the skill-based amusement games um, using Excel spreadsheets and things like that. Um, in the future, we will do an RFP and get that to where that's all um, computer um, software based to where we can make those distributions quickly and do that. Um, but at this point, it's not prudent um, without knowing whether the, uh, the bill or a bill will move forward and authorize them beyond July of, of 21. But back to your direct question, it, it has been tough. Um, it's taken a lot of hours from a lot of people, but it's dedicated staff. And, and I do have to give, give my staff and also it's, it's, it's taken, I'm very fortunate to work with uh, a and I division. They've been incredibly helpful on the accounting side for us in helping us uh, human resources um, right when a lot of the budget in uh, COVID hit. We had had some vacant positions and getting those filled as quickly as possible. And that's been, been a blessing for me. Um, and then also working very closely with the Attorney General's office. Um, you know, we've, we've definitely gotten everybody to help, help lift this. It's not just me, for sure. Uh, one more follow-up, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Uh, Senator uh, and Somebody Dalton expressed some concern earlier, and I guess I have too. Uh, is there any, are you seeing any outside influence criminal activity coming from outside the state? putting pressure on, on legalized gambling or these portions in our state? Uh, Chairman Driscoll, Representative Moniz, th that's always a concern. Whenever you have wagering, whenever there's money involved, there's always that, that uh, kind of seedy side, I guess. Um, it's inherent, it comes, it, it's part of it. And, and that's what, while I'm not dismissing it by any means, that's what we spend 99% of our time looking at. And whether it's in the horse racing side of the house, uh, whether it's it's the historic racing, the gambling side there, you know, that's what we spend. Again, like I said, 95% of my time is dealing with um, probably a five to 10 percenter. And, and with that, um, you know, you always need to be mindful. There's also 95% or higher, depending on, on where you are, that are good people, that are good activities. Um, with the, um, the paramutual side, all of the individuals that participate in paramutual wagering, the owners, um, the, the management have all gone through background checks, criminal history reviews, um, and, uh, and, and we, we spend a tremendous amount of time um, going through those and reevaluating them every year. Um, the licensees at the racetrack, uh, we, we fingerprint those, we're reviewing criminal history, and we do deny licenses um, at the live racing uh, for criminal activity. Um, we do have several ongoing investigations. I'm unable to discuss those at this time. Um, because they are, on, are ongoing criminal investigations, and I'm sure you all appreciate that. Um, but it, it is a part of it. It's something that, that is a concern always. Um, we work with the Division of Criminal Investigation. We work with local law enforcement and uh, just keep trying to do the best we can with what we have and protect the Wyoming citizens. Well, Charlie, for my part, uh, thanks for doing a good job to you and your staff. I, I believe it has been a heavy lift for you. Thanks for all you do. Uh, Chairman Driscoll, Senator Moniz, I, I appreciate that coming from you all. Um, tremendously respectful of, of every one of you on the committee and, and understand you, you do um, see, and, and, and I do appreciate that from every one of you. I also appreciate the questions. Um, part of my job, one of the hardest things of my job, and I keep being reminded of this every year, is educating not only the public, but also educating the legislature on gaming and gaming activities. And, and, and trust me, um, this gaming report uh, probably created more questions for me even too. 
and it's uh, you start diving into it. And I hate to say it, I probably could have gone on for another 40 pages. And finally, I had to stick a fork in it and, and call it good. So, but thank you. On, on the page that's in front of you now, um, if I can move on, I do give you some just kind of what we're looking at currently right now with staffing. I do have six full-time employees and one TPO1 position, um, which is a temporary position we do have. And then in the summer months, we do employ uh, five additional employees with the racetracks. And that includes veterinarians, judges for the racetrack, safety personnel um, at the racetrack. And, you know, again, to speak to the, the regulatory side of it at the racetrack, um, we are taking, we're one of the few states that is taking hair sampling of the horses. We also take urine samples of the horses and we're taking blood samples. So um, there's probably only four or five states that are currently uh, taking hair samples and we uh, use a laboratory through an RFP. Chairman Driscoll, we have a question from Senator James, I believe. Thank you. I don't see all of them. Senator James. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Speaking of uh, the horses, that just came in my mind. What uh, what ended up happening with the horses and the jockey situation uh, where the horses had to be put down, that whole accident situation? Whatever came of that, did, did, the, what, uh, did the investigation turn up on that? Driscoll Center, James, again, thank you. Um, yes. Uh, we don't have all of our, we haven't gotten all the toxicology reports back yet from the, the three horses that were affected. Again, we draw um, we take hair samples and blood samples when possible from those individuals and we have not gotten those toxicology reports back yet. But however, we did conduct a full and complete investigation, my two law enforcement investigators, um, along with our three stewards and our safety officer at the racetrack while incredibly unfortunate and plus happening um, on one day at the races, uh, it was virtually impossible to find any, any connection between any of the three. Um, the one of them had a, had a situation to where the, the, the individual horse was, had pressure placed on it and went over the top of the outside rail. And that was an isolated incident. The other two horses, uh, again, through the, the veterinary reports, we had our state veterinarian, excuse me, the commission veterinarian, not the state vet, the commission's veterinarian, because we employ a veterinarian, plus there's also practicing veterinarians. Um, they reviewed um, the individuals and we just couldn't connect anything to it. So um, whenever we have an accident of any kind, whether, and I had a discussion yesterday with someone about this, this as well, whether it is at one of our OTBs a problem, whether it's with the skill-based amusement game locations or whether it's at the racetrack, it's very important for the commission to sit down with everyone afterwards, whether you call it an exit interview, whatever you want to call it, and sit down. Typically, that we have learned through law enforcement is you want to wait about 72 hours um, with the individuals, and then sit down and interview everybody. And then let's sit down, not necessarily pointing fingers, um, but if fingers need to be pointed, obviously you, you take action, and, and we do have that authority at the racetrack to do that, Senator James. Um, but sit down and find out and evaluate what can we do better. Um, I very much believe in that kind of a philosophy. If you have a problem, sit down, talk through it, see what we can do better, what we don't want to do again, and, and then move forward and change your policies and be flexible. So the short answer, and I apologize for taking so long, is we were unable to find any any connections between them all. Um, and uh, again, we reviewed their veterinary reports prior 
And also these individual, all three of these animals were, um, re, were um, we do pre-race examinations. And so each one of these horses was examined by our commissioned veterinarian the morning of the races. Um, you know, the, the safety of the horse and the rider is paramount. Um, safety of people at these events is, is what I lose sleep of. Um, and it is, it is priority one. Um, it's number one. I just can't stress that enough. So thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I may ask a question. Go ahead, Representative Flintner. Thank you. Mr. Moore, before we leave this page, I'm just curious about sports wagering. In states that have gone ahead and embraced that, do they all have a, a brick and mortar presence along with the online? Is it necessary to have both? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Driscoll, um, Representative Flintner, sports wagering, you know, I, I can't, I think most all of the locations, and I'd have to go back and, and look at some of my attachments that are connected in the sports wagering piece. I think they're, um, it's a combination of a lot of them, whether they're brick and mortar or whether they're online. Um, you know, in Colorado, I believe they do have both. It's a, uh, they feel like it's a very, it, it's a competitive market. Um, most everybody also feels like it's important for it to be a competitive market, not just one vendor for the state, keep it competitive. And, and that does a couple things. It keeps everybody, you know, at a competitive rates uh, in trying to, but it is a little, maybe has the potential to be a little more difficult for the, the regulators. But again, sports wagering um, is automated. They're automated systems and, and they do fit in well. They seem to for regulatory markets. Um, sports wagering in Colorado, um, is, is been launched and, and done quite well in my estimation. Um, it's, a, it's a good model on how they did it uh, to look at and to review moving forward. And I've had a lot of conversations with the director there and, and with the individuals involved with that in Colorado. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. I I have a question too uh, on this expansion of gambling. As, as you know, I, I had supported an opt-in option for all this gambling uh, and we ended up with an opt-out. Uh, do we still have the opt-out uh, availability? And then with the expansion, uh, is that uh, open? It, it is those new expansions uh, available for the counties or the uh, cities to opt out, or is this a one blanket thing that once they're uh, they're in, uh, re regardless of the expanding of the gambling, uh, will will they have an uh, a option to opt out of certain forms of gambling, or is it uh, they one blanket they got to take it all or or nothing? Thank you. Representative Tass, I think I'll do part of it. Charles, we can follow up if he needs. What we really did was it's only legal till July and there's gonna be a new form if anything's to happen. Uh, anything is on the table for what's in that bill for what moves forward. Uh, I believe what Director Moore has been presenting is all the things that are out there, not necessarily what's coming at you. He's just piece by piece going through all the different types that are out there and all the different things that could happen. And, you know, ultimately uh, this committee will decide today whether they bring a bill. If they do not bring a bill, I'm sure there'll be either individual bills or bills from other committees that come. Uh, and you'll have, or you, whoever replaces you, uh, will have the ability to amend those bills for uh, just like we did the last one. Okay, Director thank you very much. Uh, follow up on that. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, got a lot of good people on, on this committee and 
uh, wish you luck. Uh, wish, wish you well. Uh, <laughs> well okay. Uh, thank you very much. Director Moore, did Driscoll? you have follow up? Chairman Driscoll, if I could follow up with, with uh, Representative Task. Um, you know, the, the horse racing is an opt-in. Uh, and currently we have two more counties that are uh, looking at having it on the ballot. I believe we have Hot Springs County and Park County, which uh, have paramutual wagering going to be on their November ballot. So that, that's exciting. They're expanding. Um, and, uh, you know, again, as, as, the, uh, as Chairman Driscoll said, um, that is up to you all how that, that functions and that mechanism. And again, these are just, just some of the things that I pulled up and, and came up with and, and ideas and, and giving you some options following up with the, uh, the total gaming report. On this page that's in front of you right now, we, we do have just, these are just some considerations and questions. You know, um, further reviewing the skill game definition, definition, you know, what is skill? And again, these are, these are not necessarily suggestions. They're just to get everybody kind of thinking and, and trying to kind of, kind of get your head wrapped around it. You know, what is skill? And again, in addition to that is, at what extent is it required with the skill-based amusement games? This is just, is it just ordinary skill, the skill of a typical person who performs a given task? And that's in Black's Law Dictionary. Also, what is a successful outcome? Um, we've had that question come up a time or two when, when reviewing, is it a penny? Is it a nickel? Is it a dime? Or is it a return on your total wagers that you've placed? Um, and then also, too, um, you know, we do need to add into um, further legislation. We need to make sure that we have an opportunity to license and have oversight over the manufacturers, whether um, in, in the historic racing side, the manufacturers of the skill games are all licensed. Um, with the skill-based amusement games, we didn't have that in the bill. And I know it was discussed at different times throughout that bill, but as you all know, um, that was pretty much an up and down and around the whole time. And that was, that was quite a, a lift for you all. Also, um, the next line there, we need to look at potentially allowing for flexible payment, different types of payments. Um, we have different games with the skill-based amusement games that are, uh, and I think we have people maybe that are waiting to testify that they can explain a little more how they, how their, uh, their games operate and their payments. But um, currently under the law we have, we're not allowed, we can't take a prepayment, which seems a little odd to me because if I can get the money up front, I think I'd rather have the money for the state up front than waiting till later. Um, but we're, we're unable to do that. So allow the commission some flexibility as far as that goes. Also, uh, again, like I'd stated earlier, maybe look at some uniformity in uh, the paramutual age versus the lottery versus the skill games, just some consistency because it does create um, um, confusion once in a while. The number is basically immaterial to me. It's, it's just a number, but um, the consistency of those ages um, there may be a more logical way to approach that. And then also, again, this is partially, this has been a, a push from, from some of the different, the vendors and the different operators and things, looking at cashless wagering. Um, I think there's a social side of this as well that needs to be taken into consideration. But with COVID-19, we're seeing a lot of places, uh, different places are looking at the cashless side of the house. Again, um, just something to think about, kind of having your... <clears throat> and then finally, um, this is something that, that we, I had uh, brought forward working with DFS. And this is basically a child support um, trying to recapture from, uh, from the winnings. Um, this wouldn't apply to the smaller jackpots 
the commission, if this was, was authorized, we would have to set a threshold five to 10,000 maybe on the, on the jackpots or you all could dictate that as well um, would be no problem, but to where we can collect child support. Um, uh, it's, it's kind of a thing for me. I think it's important uh, Do we help do that. Uh, the lottery has that ability in the lottery, I believe, I don't know what the numbers are right off offhand, but I think the number is significant, maybe 20, 30, 50,000, I'm not sure, is, a, is collected from lottery proceeds if you're in the rears with child support. Um, this did go through a judiciary committee a couple of years ago, and then ultimately um, it did fall by the wayside. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it is something to be be reviewed again. At least give us the authority if we want to move forward with proper rules and regulations to where we could potentially work on, on doing that for our, uh, our kids out there. <clears throat> again, in closing, gaming and gaming regulations are very complex. They evolve each day and minute by minute. As regulators and policymakers, we need to be mindful of the social and economic implications and proceed with caution. This page right here is, is something that I would hope that each and every one of you um, and our whole legislature would take the time and read the letters. I solicited, uh, and, and at the conclusion of the report, I realized I, there was other people I should have asked to write letters as well. But, you know, I thought it was important to get for you all the, uh, the views, whether it's from the Sheriff's and Chiefs Association, whether it's from Wyoming Downs, Wyoming Horse Racing, Cowboy Skills, um, a very good letter from the Northern Arapaho Business Council, um, the Wyoming Lottery, um, the liquor retailers uh, provided a letter. Um, also, we have DraftKings. Um, we have the AGEM report that they put in there and their concerns with the gray games, the skill games. But again, some of the people are responding to, um, to, to types of wagering that in their part of the country is not legal. Um, and, and, and so, there is a division that we need to remember with the skill-based amusement games. We have the authorized ones and we have the, the unauthorized ones. And, and so we still have the issue, but we're, we're getting them all together and getting them regulated, I think at this point. Uh, Global Marketing Advisors had a great submission there as well, but it's, it's helpful. I think it gives you a, a lot of insight and then here um, we have in the appendix, we have the Gaming Commission's annual report from last year. Um, and we have the impact studies, different things. And then if you're really bored at night and you want to spend time, uh, we have a multitude of, of different reports here that are actually quite good and yes, I'm afraid to say I have read every one of them. And I have a stack of them in my office that I'm, I'm going through as well. That is the conclusion of the gaming report. Very good. Uh, we'll do one final round of questions. And then if we don't have any, I think we'll take a 15 minute break and we'll come back and go to public comment and then decide if we're going to draft a bill or not. Do we have any questions from the committee? And I can't see everybody, so just speak up. Chairman Driscoll. Representative Yen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Director Moore, thank you for, for all of this work that you've done over this summer. I know it's been a, a really heavy lift for something um, for, for quite a large change to your commission as well as um, doing this report and all the work for um, keeping track and regulating all the skill games of, in a very quick uh, turnaround. So I, I, my, my question for you is, I just wanna get my numbers straight uh, just so I have it because I think as you well know, a lot of this discussion is going to be surrounded uh, around the skill games. 
Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that I have a clear picture of what the current state of the state is with skill games. So um, looking at your list, and I think what you said was that we have 306 establishments um, with skill games in them and the net proceeds in total is 3.8 million. So that gives us around an average of twelve and a half thousand dollars net proceeds per establishment. Is that correct, Director Moore? Um, I would have Chairman Driscoll, uh, Representative Yin. I, I would have to um, to divert to Mr. Dobby to maybe do that calculation quickly for you. Uh, yes, to Steve, Representative Yin, could you please? Uh, repeat the question so I know exactly what you're looking for. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, so so my question is just to try to get an average of net proceeds per establishment. So I was just doing the $3.8 million divided by the number of establishments that I, I heard Director Moore say, which was 306. So that comes to 12.4 uh, thousand per net proceeds per establishment. I just wanted to make sure I had that in my head when discussing um, the skill games going forward. Yeah, they've raised about 1.3 million so far. So if you do divide that by the total number of establishments, that would give you the uh, the average uh, tax revenue raised per um, establishment. That would be correct. <clears throat> and let's see. does that answer your question, Representative Yen? Yes, thank okay. you. And you know, Co-Chair Miller, Co-Chair Driscoll, if I could please speak on some of the earlier questions. I ran some numbers and I think I have some answers. Yeah. That's okay. Um, and earlier, uh, Representative Moniz asked, you know, if we charge $1,200 per terminal, how much tax revenue would that uh, represent monthly on these skill-based amusement games? And if you did charge $1,200 um, per terminal, you'd get 367,000 and some change, 367,000 basically a month in state tax revenue. And what I did is I converted um, what we're currently raising in tax revenue and converted it to a monthly basis. And the skill-based amusement games are averaging a little over 321,000. And so you would say, well, we're not raising as much tax revenue as we would if we just charged $1,200. But like Director Moore stated, we're in the middle of a, of a COVID. And so who knows how great these handles will be once we you know, get out of this, this period of time in history. Uh, charging, you know, the 20% on net proceeds versus the 1200, it's only a difference of about $45,000 right now a month. But I do think that the skill-based amusement games in these facilities, I think the, the, the wagering will go up, you know, <clears throat> as the COVID-19 restrictions um, ease up a little bit. Does that, did that answer your question, Representative Moniz? Thank you, yes, it does. But, and while I have you, uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman, uh, while I have you, uh, I can probably look it up and report, but you probably know what, what does the, uh, the patron, I mean, the bar owner or facility that has these machines, what, what portion of that take does that facility get per machine? Yeah, I'm not, uh, familiar with the contractual agreement between these operators and the, uh, establishments. I don't know if Director Moore has any more input on that or not. Chairman Driscoll, Senator Moniz, um, those are the contractual um, with the uh, the operators, and you know that would be a question that might be more coming from uh, to be responded to by Cowboy Skills or or one of the um, operators. But I can sure reach out to them if they are not. I assume they're on the call and follow up with you. So follow up, Mr. Chairman. So. So all you look at as a state is, is the net proceeds from those machines? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Well, there seems to be a lot of interest out there to extend the, the sunset date. And so uh, it must be somewhat financially advantageous to them. That's why I asked the question to start with. Okay. Thank you. Um, Co-Chair Driscoll, could I try to answer your question real quick that you asked earlier? Um, with regards to the effective tax rate, you know, if we were going to tax the historical horse racing uh, operators on their net proceeds, like we are the, the skill games, the effective tax rate uh, 
let me rephrase that. If we, if you look at the amount of tax revenue that's been raised by the historical horse rating, racing operators, the equivalent tax rates would be 22.88% of their net proceeds. So in effect, the historical horse racing operators are paying almost a 3% uh, difference or above and beyond with the skill-based uh, operators because skill-based operators are paying 20% on their net proceeds. If you want to raise the exact same ta tax revenue based on net proceeds on the historical horse racing operators, we'd have to charge a 22.88% tax rate on their net proceeds to generate the same amount of revenue that they're, that they're generating taxing their handle. Does that answer your question, um, Co-Chair? Uh, yes. Further questions? Further questions? Looks like we've pretty well got them answered. It is 1012. We will come back at 1030. We'll give 18 minutes. Everybody can take a little bit of a break and we'll start on public comment. Uh, we've got a pretty long list of public comment and then we'll talk about whether we want to work a bill because the public comments going to stitch into whether whether we come up with a bill or not so we'll be back in at 10:30.
looks like we're pretty well ready to go back in. Uh, I think we're short. Looks like maybe Representative Freeman and Edwards. Are you folks on? It's homie Dalton. I'm here. Okay, we'll come back to order again. I've got to pull my list up. We've got a pretty long list of public testimony. I'm going to ask everybody that's got testimony to make to uh, not do things over and over again and keep it as concise as you can. We've got a, a pretty long list and we're just going to let you uh, go on your own. So first one on the list we have is Lori Herbertite, Wyoming Horse Racing, LLC. I see she's up. We'll let her in and uh, welcome Lori and uh, let you go from there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Lori Erbekite with Wyoming Horse Racing LLC. And to answer a question that Senator Anselmi Dalton had earlier this morning, Wyoming Horse Racing LLC is a limited liability company. The managing partner is Eugene Joyce. He and his wife, Karen, um, have had a home in Evanston, Wyoming for over 30 years. The two other partners are Mike and Tim Latner. Uh, the, the brothers live in the Chicago area is my understanding. Um, they have been friends with Mr. Joyce since high school. That's how that partnership came together. Um, you will see Tim Latner at the racetracks during the live meets. He drives the tractor to groom the, uh, <clears throat> the tracks. So that um, will save you from wondering about where those people are from. Um, Mr. Chairman, as far as our comments today, uh, we think that Thus far, the, um, the bill that was passed in the last session has worked pretty well. Um, we realize that there are a lot of other products out there. You had a lot of discussion about the video gaming terminals, um, what the commission or what the legislature decides to do with that moving forward um, is, is certainly up to the legislature. But we would encourage you to remember the people that brought you to the dance and um, the Wyoming skill games and the uh, uh, Wyoming racing industry, horse racing industry, um, have been functioning quite well, have done a good job at raising money for the state. And so we would ask that any uh, further expansion of gaming in Wyoming be tied to those two, um, two entities. Either um, the proceeds need to go to expand live horse racing as um, we do currently, or it needs to benefit the small mom and pop um, bar owners as the skill games do. Um, those we would like you to, to keep keep the gaming in in that realm so that we can continue to grow um, making bringing more and more people into uh, the industry is not going to um, make the pie bigger it's just going to cut up the pieces smaller so um, we appreciate all the work that has been done we appreciate uh, director Moore's efforts on the uh, gaming report and I'd be happy to try and answer any questions any questions for Mr. Herbert? Must have done a good job. Thank you very much. Uh, next is Catherine Wilkinson and Jonathan Downey in a cowboy skill. I think we, if we can let them both in, we will. Oh, they're together. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Hello. members of the committee. Catherine Wilkinson and Jonathan Downing representing Cowboy Skill today. Uh, we would just like to share with you and remind you that we do have eight operators that cover um, most of the state of Wyoming. We have 611 games in 230, or excuse me, 611 games in 232 locations. Uh, members of the committee, Mr. Chairman, today our main ask is to ask for the removal of the sunset date. Uh, the legislature made the policy decision to pass 171 uh, House Enrolled Act 95 last year or earlier this year to see how it would work to have some regulation for skill games. We uh, believe that the process has shown that the regulation has been effective. It's been good. Um, it was needed. And so that is our number one ask for you today is if you would consider removing the uh, sunset date. We also have some additional uh, clarification points for to add on to 171 as a framework for the Gaming Commission. Um, it is out outlined in the handout that we emailed to all of you. Uh, those specifically would be to expand the definition of skill-based amusement games. 
to allow our taxes to be prepaid. Um, as of right now, Cowboy Skill has actually paid $1 million, uh, over $1 million just this week in taxes. Um, year to date. Um, in reserve, we still have $266,000 that we would like to submit to the state, but are unable to do so right now with the weekly requirements. Last week alone, we paid $63,288.46. Uh, so we would allow, ask if you could allow those taxes to be uh, prepaid. We would also like to add a definition of manufacturer and add permitting for the manufacturers as well with license fees. Uh, we would like to change the responsibility of providing a lab report to the manufacturer rather than an operator. We do not want any skill game rooms. We are happy with four per establishment. Uh, so we would like to see that specified that there are no game rooms. And we would like to see background checks for operators and manufacturers. Also, if the committee um, you know, has an appetite for it, we would ask for any extan uh, expansion to establishments that have liquor licenses and truck stops, not widespread expansion, but just a fairness issue to those that uh, were not allowed to do so during the moratorium. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we would stand for any questions. Any questions? Senator Meniz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jonathan, our Ms. Wilkinson, either one of you, I asked a question earlier. What percent of the take on these machines does the bar owners get? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Moniz, um, through the contractual relationship uh, for, for most skill games, as far as at least in Wyoming, you can be between 35 and 40 percent stays with the local bar owner. And then you also have a share uh, that goes to the that is split between the manufacturer operator along those lines. So that's 35 to 40 percent of the net. Of the net proceeds, sir. Okay, thank you. Further questions? Further questions? Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman this is Representative Newsom. Oh, sorry, I missed you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A question for um, Ms. Wilkinson and, and Mr. Downing, as well as uh, Ms. Urbekite. What's your feeling on um, online sports betting, on in expanding into online sports betting? Mr. Chairman? Go ahead. Um, we, we don't have a position on that end with online sports betting. Um, it's, it's more of a policy decision back to the legislature. We will check back with our client just to see if there's anything out there right now and um, get back to you if that's okay. Follow up? Answer it, Sandy. No. no news. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Just waiting. Um, excuse me. Waiting for Miss Urbekite's response. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Um, I think I will uh, stick with what Mr. Downing said, and we'll uh, defer on sports betting at, at this point. Um, our our ask has always been: let's protect the people that are already here and that are doing a good job. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Further questions? Thank you. Okay, next will be John Klontz from the Wyoming Lottery. Welcome, John. Not seeing him there. Yeah, he's there. Are you there, John? He's in the room, so. Are you on, John? Okay, we'll, we'll skip over him and come back to him. Uh, Jeremiah Riemann from the Wyoming County Commissioners Association. Jeremiah in here. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yes, welcome, uh, Jeremiah. Great. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm Jeremiah Riemann here on behalf of Wyoming's uh, County Commissioners. Uh, I do want to express my appreciation for the work that you did uh, this past legislative session. As you know, uh, commissioners were very interested in finding a regulatory framework uh, for uh, uh, this particular industry. 
including uh, skill games. It had caused uh, many issues uh, at the local level. And certainly the Wyoming Gaming Commission uh, helps to uh, establish that. And, and again, our appreciation for that. Your uh, work also instituted uh, a revenue source for both uh, the state as well as uh, local governments, including counties. Uh, and that is proven to be a much needed resource uh, during this period of time. Uh, you heard earlier uh, around the text that in fact we have uh, at least two counties uh, where uh, the voters will have the opportunity to consider whether to expand into uh, paramutual uh, gaming uh, this fall. Hot Springs and, and Park County voters will have uh, that opportunity uh, in November. Uh, I say all of this uh, to say that we've reached a positive uh, outcome. Uh, and as such, uh, the WCCA does support uh, the legislature moving forward uh, with removing that sunset uh, around uh, skill-based amusement games. I'd also say that uh, we would support uh, the ability for the industry to uh, prepay its taxes. Uh, how many companies do we have in this time and age uh, coming forward to uh, ask, for, ask for that ability, and, and we certainly think we should honor that. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to stand any questions, but appreciate your support today. Questions for Mr. Riemann. Uh, Representative Yen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Riemann, thanks for joining us. Um, so my question for you is, if we decided to expand skill-based amusement games, would you prefer some sort of opt-in from a county by county perspective or opt-out? Thank you, Mr. Riemann. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Yen, appreciate uh, that question. Uh, that is another component of what, what uh, commissioners had previously asked for is to, to have that option. Uh, you know, typically the commissioners prefer to have uh, the ability uh, uh, to uh, opt in uh, but uh, have indicated in the past that they're very welcome to have either one option, but they certainly would like to have the option. Further questions? Further questions? Thank you, Mr. Riemann. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Gunnar Malm, Laramie County Commissioner. Welcome, Gunnar. Welcome. Or thank you very much, Mr. Chairman uh, and committee. I just wanted to briefly speak in favor of legislation uh, in regards to skill games. I won't reiterate many of the points that Mr. Riemann brought up, uh, but to just touch on a few, we would like to see, or I would like to see a, a removal of the sunset date on um, the legislation. And, um, you know, like Mr. Riemann mentioned, in a time where revenue is becoming scarcer and scarcer, uh, not only from the state to counties, but uh, the ability for counties to raise revenues within their borders, uh, opportunities like this and um, expansion of uh, gaming opportunities really add revenue to our general fund that we're able to utilize across the board for uh, programs and funding that we are seeing diminished at the state. So. I'm happy to answer any questions. This is for Mr. Mall. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Next is Joshua Camp, Kammerer from the corner bar in Shoguns. Is he on? Not seeing the screen. I don't believe he's in the room. Uh, Yes, well, uh, I'm looking at people that have been in, into the room. Uh, Chris Brown, are you ready to testify from Wyoming Lodging Restaurant and Bank Shot Skill Games? Mr. Chairman, can you hear me okay? Welcome, Mr. Brown. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman and Committee. Um, Chris Brown representing Bank Shot Skill Games. We have 175 machines located in 62 locations across the state. Um, located in small businesses, bars, convenience stores, restaurants, hotels, etc. Um, and while I realize that this initiative started long before we engaged in it last session, from our perspective, the primary goals of the bills that passed last session have been achieved. Um, we, we created the Gaming Commission so that all games in the state are housed under one regulatory authority. 
there's a limit on the amount of games that may, that may be placed in each location, a limit on the amount that can be wagered, a limit on the amount that can be paid out. And, um, and skill games have to be in an area clearly defined in an establishment allowing only 21 plus. Um, finally, games have to pass the muster and ensure that they've been tested by a nationally recognized laboratory to make sure that they are operating per state statute or they have to be immediately removed from the state. Um, as has been mentioned, Mr. Chairman, the games are helping generate taxes that fund, game, that fund the gaming commission um, with the balance going to a local and state government as discussed earlier. But I think it's important to realize also that they're also driving traffic and generating revenue for small businesses. And that is no small point during these challenging times. To speak to Senator Moniz's question about how much the establishment makes from the skill games, um, from our skill games, the establishment keeps 40% of the net proceeds. And so Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, our hope today is that the committee will advance a bill that will eliminate the July uh, 2021 sunset will also allow for a cautious expansion of skill-based amusement games. And I bring that up only to, um, for the committee to realize that there are a handful of establishments out there that had games that turned out to be illegal um, no, through no fault of the business owner in many uh, instances. It turned out that the games that they had were not able to pass the muster with the nationally recognized testing. Um, and we and the other legal skill games company would appreciate the opportunity to be able to expand into those um, establishments that are kind of left hanging right now. Um, in a time when small businesses are facing uncertainty every day due to the pandemic, we feel like eliminating the sunset would be one small step in the right direction of certainty for small businesses across the state. And so I appreciate the committee's time today very much and I'm happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman. Question is for Mr. Brown. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have Mr. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Hi, I'm sorry. Did you call out Shogun's Pizzeria in the corner bar? I did a minute ago. Are you okay, the one on the are phone? In attendance. Are, are you on the phone? Yes. Uh, if you'd like to go ahead and identify yourself and give your testimony, we'll go ahead and, and get you in. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Stephanie Kramer. My husband, Josh Kramer, is also in attendance, um, and we thank you for having us today. We currently own and operate two small businesses in Carbon County, Rollins, Wyoming, um, which is the Corner Bar and Shogun's Pizzeria. Bankshot Skills Games um, has played an essential role in the success of our businesses. Um, the revenue that the skills machines uh, provide has helped us with business operating costs and our mortgage payments. The skills machines currently cover up to 50% of our operating costs each month for one of our operating businesses. Um, and without the income that the skills machines generate, one of our current businesses would be left with no other option than to close. Um, so with that being said, we do 100% rely on the machines financially. Um, the machines provide entertainment for our community. And as a business owner, we are driven by how we can fulfill the needs of our community. Um, the machines have met a need by providing family-friendly entertainment to the elderly, um, people without means of travel, those with health issues, and those who simply want entertainment and amusement. Um, having the machines gives back to both the community and to the state. And the machines is a game we feel for business owners, the state of Wyoming, the community and our customers. Um, so with that being said, we do ask that the state would consider keeping the skills games um, as they do play an essential role in the continued success and growth of both of our businesses. So that is what we have to say and we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions for Ms. Kramer? Uh, Representative Yen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for joining us. And I appreciate the testimony from a business that has one of these machines. Um, I think my question for you would be, if you had the opportunity, if, this, if the state of Wyoming expanded into to, to full on video slot machines and you had the opportunity to put one in your, or your pizza parlor, would you decide to put one in your pizza parlor? Absolutely. 
further questions? Nope, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, great testimony, very much appreciated. Uh, Mr. Klontz, are you on still here somewhere? I don't see any, he is. Uh, Mr. Klontz from the Wyoming Lottery Corporation, uh, are you ready? You're muted, Mr. Klontz. Still muted. There we How's go. That? Uh, welcome. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am ready to go, sir. Proceed. Can you hear me okay? All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is John Klontz, and I'm the CEO of the Wyoming Lottery, Lottery Corporation. And thank you for uh, allowing me to make some brief comments. Uh, first of all, regarding the uh, Gaming Commission report and, and Mr. Moore's report, we've uh, been meeting with Mr. Moore periodically to provide him whatever he needs in the way of help from us. And uh, we do have, uh, there is some information about the lottery in an, in an appendix on the report. So uh, we would encourage everyone to take a look at that when you get a, a chance. And uh, we also, uh, uh, during this COVID virus time, you know, we've been conscientious about reducing costs while we're still trying to maximize revenue. So. We've got the October transfer coming up and uh, it looks like we're gonna have just over $1.2 million to put towards the transfer, which will happen on October 5th. But during this time, we're still trying to reduce costs in travel and uh, in marketing and advertising and those things while still uh, doing enough promotions that we can move the product and uh, maximize our opportunities when it comes to the transfer. One of the other things we're doing is adding another game. I mentioned two by two at a previous uh, committee hearing. Two by two is a daily game. We don't have a daily game currently in the portfolio. And so we think this uh, new game, which will come out in February, uh, will bring in around 350, 360,000 in additional net revenue to the transfer on an annual basis. So break that down you know, to the quarter. So we're continuing to try to do everything we can uh, to provide entertainment uh, value, but also to continue adding more to that net transfer. Uh, and uh, this is one of the things we're gonna do in the meantime, while we're still working out some bugs with putting Kino in. Um, we appreciate uh, the fact that we are still a private corporation and instrument of the state. Uh, being structured that way has allowed us a lot of flexibility and a lot of maneuverability that we wouldn't otherwise have. So uh, the board and I continue to try to do whatever we can to uh, add to the portfolio, uh, but at the, at the same time reduce costs, as I said, and work together with the Gaming Commission if there's anything we can do with them to help them. And so far, total transfers to the state are, have reached the $20 million mark. Total winnings we've paid out almost 80 million and retailers have received just about 11 million in terms of commissions uh, for the 450 locations that we have. And so uh, with that, that's all I have to say. Just a quick update and any questions are welcome. Questions for Mr. Klontz. I guess we all know about the lottery. Thank you very much, Mr. Klontz. All right, thank you. I think we'll go down. I've got a Troy and a Kathy and I can't read the last name on it. Can we go ahead and catch them while they're in the room? Are you on? Can you hear us Troy and Kathy? We're not getting audio from you. Do they show they're on, Mary Beth? Okay, we'll we'll let them work on it. We'll go ahead and go with. Are you on now, Troy and Kathy? Um, okay, Byron Odecoven, are you ready from Sheriff's and Albert and Chiefs? 
I know Byron's ready all the time. I am, sir. She's about to turn Hello. the call, I presume. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Uh, Byron Odikoven, the Executive Director of the Wyoming Association of Sheriffs and Chiefs of Police. Ah, there's my, I'll click the button that says start my video. There we go. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to offer a couple of comments this morning. Let me speak uh, generally on where we are at the moment and kind of where we have been to derive at this point in time. So I think as you pointed out in the very beginning, uh, gambling is, is illegal in Wyoming, except, and the statutes we're talking about today creates that exception for uh, primarily the skill-based or what Wyoming has chosen to call skill-based games. Uh, other states, if you recall, call them all kinds of things from gray games, skill games. Um, I think it's Illinois that has a particular number that they call the game as part of the title. So it kind of fits the statutory scheme uh, of whatever the state that they're in. The definition, let me point out a couple of um, overall problem areas, if you will, uh, that seem to have come about with Wyoming's decision to kind of pretty much allow everything uh, with, with a let's get started and then we'll talk about it next year kind of general sense of where we're headed. So the definition, first and foremost, the definition is what then sets the stage for the games that are allowed. So the definition that was crafted in the very last moments of the legislature, while we were talking about how it would be a, a fairly tight definition, limit the machine style of machines, ensure credibility of the machine, actually the definition is very broad. It turns out to be so broad that we talk about testing of machines for integrity, that testing of the machine is based and it's tested against the Wyoming statute. Not against other machines, not against machines in other states, not against what it means in other states, what those machines that could operate in Wyoming, do they fit the statute? So for example, if you have that machine that would pass Wyoming statute based on the definition, could very well be an illegal game in another state based on that state's definition of the amount of skill involved or, or the manner to which the payout is derived. So I think it's important to know that in the greater scheme of things, you are at choice if you want to have lots, several, and many machines, then you have a fairly broad definition, easy to achieve. If you want to have a limited uh, look, if you will, to ensure integrity, to ensure compliance, to ensure that you have the best machine, then you have a more limiting uh, definition. And so that is one of the things that I think going forward if you want to continue to have very broad gambling in Wyoming, you'll need to set the stage for the de definition. Having said that, based on the definition, it is very difficult and virtually impossible for local law enforcement to look at, view, determine, or for that matter, even the state, as you can tell from the number of machines that have been authorized, or, or those that have been tested that came back fine, even though in other states they're illegal, um, to be dealt with. Uh, along those lines, we've had local law enforcement has had zero training uh, in how to recognize, deal, or assist the state with any collection of tax, taxes to ensure proper regulation is adhered to or proper submissions and it's primarily fallen to, and I think Director Moore testified that they're now up to six employees. Clearly, that's not enough to deal with. And I uh, would hope at some point someone asks him, have you actually, as the Gaming Commission, looked at every machine that's operated in Wyoming in every establishment in which it's operated? And I'm fairly confident that the answer would be no. So that points to the third issue, and that is that the system that we have established is in a system of an honor system. 
uh, that establish, and I'm not trying to speak disparaging of any operators or um, owners, merely point out that it is a complete honor system of this is what I've made, this is what I'm paying in taxes, this is where the machine is, um, I've signed and, and sent it in, for lack of a better way of describing it. I, I mentioned that because if we remember when we started this, we had some unscrupulous operators who were blatantly choosing to violate the law to their gain. And now we're suggesting because we've passed a statute, all operators all the time would follow the law. It's somewhat counterintuitive. And I think it points that we need to have that regulation and oversight to ensure the proper credibility and integrity of Wyoming's version of gambling is adhered to. The other area um, uh, that is of concern uh, is the statute contemplates that, would want, that the Gambling Commission would undertake a process to develop rules uh, for uh, gambling in Wyoming. And they had to do that in a very quick um, time frame. And it's unfortunate that from appearance sake, the rules are a skeletonized set of rules, if you will, with not much meat and potatoes to them. Um, they are not a ro robust uh, set of rules. I believe during the session, we talked about we would, the, the legislature's intent was to create the gaming statute, uh, provide a definition, and then allow the gaming commission to go forth and do what they should do. And that is develop the rules uh, for that integrity for that clarification, for that honesty, for that verification process. And those rules are basically a skeleton set of rules, kind of a band-aid to the process while everyone is kind of anxious to determine whether you want to proceed full blast or scale it back in some manner. So it's a, it's a year in transition, but I think it's important that the rules that we have in place now are just the minimal bare bones basics and do not allow for proper oversight uh, to ensure that the citizens of Wyoming, while having a gaming experience, are being dealt an honest hand, no, no pun intended. It also uh, points out the lack of supervision, the lack of oversight, and the lack of proper rules. We don't know if the numbers that you're being um, shown or the numbers that are being generated and turned in are real and accurate without that degree of oversight. Um, our counterparts in other states have talked about when oversight uh, increased, when the rules were tighter, it seemed the money flowed a little stronger. I'm not sure the correlation, but that seems to be the experience of other states and would ask for some consideration if you choose to go forward that we have a proper set of rules that you increase the staff to the Gaming Commission to provide that strong oversight and regulatory framework. If you choose to go forward and as we go forward, we also need local law enforcement training. At the moment, local law enforcement officers are merely relying on a sticker uh, at best and have no, have no other training to differentiate between the various machines, the style of stickers, this type of um, uh, rules associated with the different uh, machines. So it's somewhat troubling uh, during this year of transition that we haven't, um, we don't have everything in place to make sure that that proper gambling um, is taking place. There was a question of outside influence. Um, and I would offer that based on some of my discussions with some of my counterparts, some of the folks who are wanting to come to Wyoming are kind of anxious to come to Wyoming because our definition is fairly weak. And at this point, so are the rules and so are the, is the oversight. So I'm guessing we'll see more and more folks want to come to Wyoming to enjoy the opportunity to make money under Wyoming's rules where they may not be able to make money in under the rules in their home state. Let me look, um, investigations. Um, I'm not sure how we would be able to conduct an investigation of some of these machines at the moment. Uh, as I said, with the um, uh, uh, definition, uh, uh, 
uh, that forensic review of the machine where it must fit that definition is pretty lax. Uh, so I'm not sure what a definition uh, of an investigation would even entail um, or how we would do much more than what is just a cursory overview of the machine, recognizing that everyone's on their honor to uh, turn in the proper amount, funds, dollars, paperwork, et cetera. So I guess in summation, uh, we would ask, um, as we always have, if you're going to go about gambling, please do it well, please do it right, please do it thoroughly, please do have a strong definition, a strong regulatory scheme, strong oversight and proper staffing to the issue, or we're left with just the free for all. Uh, we, we potentially could end up with a pretty large free for all of folks wanting to come and participate under a weak system for Wyoming. With that, Mr. Chairman. Question, Senator James. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd just like to say I'm a little surprised with this criticism of the rules since it is one of his lobbyists writing the rules for the state under the Wyoming Gaming Commission contract. So yeah, I'd just like to make that comment. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Odegovin. Thank you. Uh, I think it's important to know that we're, uh, the rulemaking process at the moment is um, uh, being oversaw, overseen by the Attorney General's Office uh, within the framework of the statute that we have before us today. So the statute we have before us um, is somewhat limiting in the rule process um, if it was up to us, so to speak, or the law enforcement side to offer rules that would be much more thorough, much tighter, much stronger and provide that proper oversight and staffing as well. So um, we'd be happy to help with that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Further questions? Senator Salmi Dahl. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, thanks, Mr. Odekoven. I would be interested in seeing um, you know, proposed changes or language that you would like to see. Obviously, sounds like you have given more thought perhaps. Um, and I don't know if you have some things that you've already you know, you could send to us. Do you have things like that? And second, I'd just like to ask if you feel like at least it's better now that we have some sort of regulatory oversight versus the free for all with uh, that we were kind of under before. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, let me take um, start that quite or response uh, with the second part first. Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, it would be better to have regulation oversight and statutory direction than none of the above. Um, and as to the uh, regulations, um, we have worked with the, the uh, Gambling Commission and offered some suggestions to them as the proper pro protocol for that rulemaking process. It would be inappropriate for us to then offer it to uh, the legislature, so to speak, without uh, or outside that framework. Further questions? Senator James. So when your lobbyists is, are writing these rules, is it the attorney general that's making them so weak or is it coming to the attorney general this week? Thank you. I don't, there's not really an answer. I, I don't think it's established the lobbyists are writing any rules, Senator James. Let's be clear about what's happening here. We take input from everybody on the rules, but they actually do not write the rules. So uh, you, you need to be clear as far as the public goes that lobbyists do not write rules. They have input into them, but they do not write them. The, the commission itself is an appointed commission and they're who does the rules. So other questions? Senator Meniz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, just to comment uh, Byron, I agree with about everything you said, actually. I just read your letter that was on, on the report. Uh, there were suggestions in it. A lot of them line up with actually some of the suggestions that were in the report. Uh, and I guess I would note that this, this law is a work in progress by, by any means. And uh, I would sure hope we solicit your input in the future. Uh, 
uh, on this issue and also remind the committee that this committee is going to look a whole lot different next year. There's four in the House and at least one in the Senate that won't be here next year. So well, the committee is going to look a lot different and these new members in this committee got a lot of homework to do to even deal with this issue. Uh, but Mr. Odekovan, appreciate your input and I hope we listen to it. Thank you. Further questions, Mr. Odekovan? I thank you for your wisdom and input. Uh, thank you very much. I think we're down to- uh, Mr. The, Chairman, if I may, if I may, one sure. other comment? Absolutely. Mr. Chairman, thank, thank you. Um, and it's our view, and I, and I hope that's been clear, it's not our position to say yes or no to the topic of gambling or to say it's good or bad. It's been our position to say, as, as I've said, if you're going to do it, do it well. Uh, make sure your tests and that which you administer are strong. Um, so um, to our fault, uh, we're saying uh, rules and regulations should be a strong set of rules and regulations if you wanna do it right. Uh, and we would be happy to assist and help point out as best we can what seems to be working in other states, what seems to be working well in terms of definitions, uh, and then it's up to the legislature. If you want to have gambling, uh, you pass the bill that says so. Uh, it's, not, it's not our position to say one way or the other in that regard, but to help uh, implement the laws once they're passed and happy to do that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Further questions? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, Representative Winter. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, during these testimonies, we've had two individuals indicate that employee or lack of employees is a problem. And I, I don't know if, is it the commission that hires these folks or does the legislature have to, to uh, appropriate money for this? Could I uh, get an answer about that? Sure. A Mr. Anyone have Mr. an answer? I can, I can take an initial stab at it and then Director Moore can uh, answer the uh, probably definitively. Uh, the statute authorizes uh, funds to go to the Gaming Commission uh, to establish this gaming regulatory setup, if you will. Uh, so it'd be up to the commission, but the commission has to have the permission of the governor's office under the budget that you've passed for him. So it's a somewhat of a catch-22 the Gaming Commission needs more folks. You're generating tax revenue to be able to do that, uh, but you have to have authorization for those personnel, both from the governor's office and within the uh, budget that you've passed as well. So it's kind of a three-part process, if I understand correctly, and would defer to Director Moore. Director Moore, do you have comments? Chairman Driscoll, thank you. Um, first off, to to respond to to one of the comments initially was 48.7 percent of the locations we have been in, we have touched the machines, we have been on those machines. The remainder of the machines in the state we have viewed via um, technical advances, whether it's iPhones, um, in inspecting them and viewing. Um, Training, we are in the process of developing that training program. Um, we should be able to conclude the training program uh, here over the next few months. Um, the rules, as far as the rules are concerned, um, it has been a long process. Um, it, it is a long process and we are working um, with, with all parties, whether it's uh, the law enforcement community or whoever to develop rules that fit for our state. As a reminder to everyone that's on this, this committee, I have two law enforcement officers that are on my commission. So they are heavily involved in this process. Um, they've made a lot of great suggestions along with, with all other uh, commissioners that we have. So, you know, they've, they've been very helpful. Um, the employees finally, um, we will be presenting to the governor's office um, a plan for additional staffing um, over the next few weeks. And I've been developing that program and that plan on how to uh, expand our staff. 
but with that, we have to be very mindful. Um, as you all know, Wyoming is in a, uh, you know, we're in a bind. Uh, just to, and, and I, I do see you have a question from Senator James, maybe. Yeah, Senator James. Uh, this is a quick question from Mr. Moore. What your training consist of for identifying um, uh, legal and illegal machine? Is it as simple as the machine has a sticker and uh, a legal machine has a sticker and the illegal one doesn't and it has like a series of numbers? Or I mean, like what's, what's it consist of? Thank you. Chairman Driscoll, Senator James, thank you. Um, we review the serial numbers on the machines. We're also able to review the software that's installed on the machines, the signatures on the machines. And, and those are the on-site when we're reviewing and inspecting, but also at a quick glance, we do utilize the stickers um, and as a, just a quick reference. And then we do take a deeper dive. Now, analyzing the gameplay, that's a whole nother story. Um, the gameplay we require reports and then we step by step through those and, and have a demo of the machines so we have a good clear understanding. I currently have uh, two machines here in our office that we work with and I guess play uh, for lack of a better word so we're very familiar with those machines and understand their inner workings. Thank you. Follow up, quick, James. Yes, quick follow up. So on the on-site inspections, like when the officers are going on-site, are they doing those in-depth uh, inspections or are they just looking at the stickers or is that the type of training that you're talking about doing or is, so is that what you're talking about for the training that you're needing to do? Chairman Driscoll, Senator James, again, thank you. Um, it, it depends. It depends on our situation that we have. Some of these inspections could be as quickly as we're going to reach out and touch uh, 50 locations um, over a span of a couple days and walking in just in looking, making sure they have the stickers on them. It just depends on our situation and what we have. But also, you know, bear in mind right now, um, the legislation asked us to, in 60 days, um, review game types, which we did. They also asked us to sticker them, which we did, and then work on the rules and the regulations that go along with that. So at this point, it's basically, we're, th we're like herding cats and we're throwing a rope around them and just gathering up, taxing them, and then preparing for the next step, which would be if you remove the sunset, we would be developing then the final phase of this, which is um, complete regulation. Okay, and one, one more. And if I remember correctly, the only way that you can get these stickers and the only way that you can uh, do a, a full and thorough uh, investigation of these machines is to get these lab reports, which actually uh, verify that these are uh, legal machines. And so are you wanting all your officers to be able to uh, go through that type of training to be able to verify all these lab reports? Chairman Driscoll, Senator James, again, another good question, no, to answer your question. Um, that is done at, at the level here in the office when we're reviewing the lab reports. The games that are out there right now um, have gone through the certification process, have been reviewed. Um, it's, a, it's a combination of staff and the AG's office that are reviewing these reports and then coming up with a conclusion. Um, moving forward, um, and, and it's, this is again, we use the same um, review system with historic racing. With historic racing terminals, we have an 18-point review along with the uh, laboratory reports, and we communicate with the laboratories. Uh, at any point in time, I can pick up the phone and have the engineers um, at the labs 
go through these with me and, and walk us through each one of the game plays. The other thing too that, that is, um, uh, you know, that we utilize with the historic racing is we're viewing these locations as well. Now, skill games at this point in time, we're not able to do that. Um, however, they are getting their operating systems up to, um, to speed. And uh, as I'd said earlier today, you know, the reporting is now online. So I don't know if I answered all of your questions or not. I apologize. Good enough, Senator James. Senator Moniz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for, for Mr. Moore again. Uh, Mr. Moore, can the, the software on these machines be altered remotely? Uh, Chairman Driscoll, Senator Moniz, not that I'm aware of, but it, it, at the end of the day, um, software and situations, that would be a very naive approach to it, um, to not believe that. That is why we're able to go in and look at the, uh, the software and do software checks. And again, with, with historic racing as well as with the skill-based amusement games, once a year, well, excuse me, twice a year, we hire a third party to come in and they review all software signatures. And it's unannounced, we come in. Um, and again, with the historic racing, um, they pull every terminal that is in the state uh, and they, they verify that software is what they tested, what they had, and we do that twice a year currently. And we will move into that same process with skill-based amusement games as well. Great, thank you. Rep Representative Leonard. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm sorry, but I still don't understand why we have a shortage of employees. Is it money or is it just finding people to uh, want the job? Or uh, it seems like if, if we're going to have a um, gaming commission, we ought to have all the, the things we need to make it work correctly. So could you explain that a little, little bit to me? Chairman Driscoll, Representative Winters, again, thank you, and I apologize. Um, that was on my notes here to respond to that, and I didn't get there. Um, additional employees for us, we have to go through a B11 or a supplemental budget process um, with the legislature or with the governor's office, and we will be presenting to the governor's office over the next few weeks um, our additional employees that we would like to see. Again, I, I do approach things conservatively, um, and, and I, that's just my nature um, of how, I, how I've operated. But the additionally is I had a discussion on Monday of this week um, with Dan Noble, Director of the Department of Revenue, to jump into and utilize some of their people that they have, train them, and work out an MOU with them. Um, to utilize their 10 field agents that they have across the state. Um, we also have MOUs. Again, I, I have always worked with other agencies and communicated with other agencies. I currently have agreements with uh, Division of Criminal Investigation. I have an agreement with uh, the Wyoming Livestock Board. Now, this does not pertain necessarily with the Livestock Board to the historic racing or the skill-based amusement gaming side of it, but I, I always want to look at ways to be more efficient, but still do the job for you. Further questions? Thank you very much. I think we're down to either one or two left. Mr. Mosier, would you like to <clears throat> clean up on this? I left you last on purpose. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mike Mosier, Wyoming State Liquor Association, uh, representing the bars, restaurants, clubs, veterans organizations, et cetera, who have many of these machines. Uh, a lot of good things have already been said. One thing I want to toss out, though, is in, in response to the prior speaker, uh, at the risk of sounding like we're from different states, the rollout and enforcement of skill games, I think, has been outstanding, and I've heard nothing but that from operators from law enforcement 
The idea that within 60 days, Mr. Moore and the Gaming Commission developed guidelines, licensed operators, and got rid of the gray games. We went to all bona fide games that were approved by the uh, Gaming Commission. I think it's outstanding. Uh, and they have stickers. If local law enforcement wants to check, look for current stickers. Uh, lo local law enforcement doesn't enforce lottery. It doesn't enforce historic horse racing for the most part. That's the Gaming Commission job. And if something's awry, you contact the Gaming Commission. Lastly, before I get to my main points, Mr. Chairman, uh, the rules were simple. Uh, that was kind of the idea. Uh, I don't think we need to get into pages and pages and pages of rules. The simpler and easier to understand, the better. Uh, we've done a fantastic job, once again, of getting rid of the gray machines, doing a great job of licensing the current ones. Mr. Moore already has enforcement people out. Now, do I agree with everything Mr. Moore and the Gaming Commission has done? No, but I cannot fault the way they've managed to roll this out, start enforcement, which they are doing inspections already and have for some time. So I, and I think everyone else on this call, except maybe one or two, uh, feel a lot of admiration and respect for the job Mr. Moore and the Gaming Commission has done collectively. Uh, to my major points, Mr. Chairman, there are two issues to our businesses uh, collectively, our businesses in Wyoming that have skill gains. Those two issues, one is important and one is vital. The first one, the important one, is the moratorium. Uh, lifting the moratorium on new games, I think is important. As Mr. Brown mentioned, some businesses had machines that weren't approved by the, liquor, the, the gaming commission, so therefore they don't have operating games. But also on the side of caution, some establishments did not put in games in the first place. I know of one establishment, for example, whose primary owner is a local elected official and he didn't wanna take that risk. Well, now that they're legal, and licensed. I think it's important we approach the idea of lifting the moratorium. However, on the next item, I would consider it vital, and that would be removing the sunset for games, which is currently June 30th, 2021. As you all know, this is an extremely difficult time for any small business, particularly those in the hospitality industry. Uh, those businesses are suffering. One of the worst parts about it, committee, and a lot of you can relate, is the uncertainty that we're dealing with. We don't know if we're gonna get shut down again. We don't know if there's gonna be a COVID outbreak, but removing that sunset would at least to these businesses give some sense of continuity that they know that they would continue to have a revenue source past June 30th of 2021. So we would strongly ask and be grateful if the committee at least addresses removing that, uh, that deadline. Uh, lastly, and if I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Newsom had asked about sports wagering and any other types of gaming that we might support. Uh, to me, sports wagering, I don't see a problem with that simply because it already exists, uh, as was mentioned in prior testimony. However, and this may shock a few of you, I urge caution in adoption of any new types of gaming beyond what we currently have. Uh, we're just getting our hands around skill games if we remove the moratorium on those uh, and, and, and eliminate the sunset, we've got games already. I don't want to, I, I don't know of any mind board who's pushing for VGTs, video gaming terminals, or anything like that. We've got historic horse racing, we've got skill games, we've got lottery. It's a beautiful world. And so I personally would not push for any expansion. Just allow the things that we currently have in place have a future that we can see. And that's about all I have, Mr. Chairman, and I would be happy to take questions. Questions for Mr. Mosier. Representative Yen. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chairman, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mosier, uh, I saw a photo on social media that looked like you weren't necessarily following the dress code uh, for a meeting. I wondered if you have any comment on that. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Representative Yen, I have changed since then, so I'm fully dressed. I'm I have tuxedo pants on. <laughs> Very good. Further questions? Further questions? Okay. Do we have anyone else, Mary Beth, in the waiting? Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure if Troy or Kathy is now able to participate. We might see if they can. If not, I, I don't believe there's anyone else. Okay, if Troy or Kathy's able to turn their mic on, and this may be our new senator from Campbell County, I'm not sure, I can't, 
and only get the first three letters. Are you able to talk to us, Troy or Kathy? Okay, well, if they can either uh, call in to us or text us and we'll, uh, it is McCowan. So uh, I, I believe Troy is our new, new Senator from Campbell County. So we'd like to welcome him if he can hear us. Uh, sure glad that you uh, taken the time to hit the ground running. So w welcome and if you get a chance to, to visit, we're happy to do it. Uh, but we'll go ahead and move on now. We're at the point in the meeting now that, whoops, I just did. Um, we're at the point in the meeting now where we've got uh, two items kind of left to deal with on our agenda. Uh, one of them is an update on Senate file 171 if we got to do some fixes in it. Um, I would suggest we probably try to deal with that first if we have someone, Charlie or Mr. Moore or someone that can lead us through it for actual fixes. The second one would be is if we're gonna do a, some type of bill on removing the moratorium or changing it, and that's probably gonna take a, a pretty good chunk of our afternoon. Um, is it, Mr. Moore, are you up to leading us through proposed changes on 171? Thank you, Chairman Driscoll. Um, I actually was not quite prepared to okay. do so I do apologize for that, but I am like anything, if you throw it in my lap, you know, we'll roll up our sleeves and we'll, we'll march through it. Yeah, no, let's, uh, let's go ahead and give you some time. Uh, I think the committee will just jump across to the bill and probably the first thing we need to do is uh, have a discussion within the committee of whether we do a bill or not, probably do a straw poll before we try to draft anything. So. Do we have comments from the committee as far as looking at a, a draft bill for dealing with the sunset and the games? Represent, or, uh, Senator Insami Dalton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would be in favor of extending the sunset. I think it has been tough um, being in the hotel business. It's been tough on these businesses and uh, restaurants that had it closed down. and. I think giving them a little more security is, is probably a good thing. So I would be in favor of extending the sunset. Thank you. Further comments? Senator James, you look like you're at least ready. I would uh, be in favor of actually removing it entirely. Okay, because that's what the process will be is if we've got a Majority of the committee will go ahead and work on draft. And that's going to take us some time. We may not get done as early as anybody thinks. Further comments? Uh, Senator Wasberger. Thank you, Ms. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the things that I would like us to see is on the report from the commission is on page 36, where it talks about the intercept program and I would ask that uh, the committee write a bill based on those nine uh, bullets for the intercept program, essentially what that does. We've already done this with paramutual wagering and also the lottery, but when a jackpot is won, uh, you look for the IRS W2G form, and if, a, uh, if the winner has not been current on their child support payments, then uh, that money will go toward their child support payments. And I would ask that uh, we do that also based on the recommendations of the commission. Senator, uh, Mr. Chairman? Go ahead. Uh, thank you. If, uh, if that is a motion by Senator uh, Westenberger, I would very much like to second that motion. I think that is... Uh, We're not to the point of doing a bill, but and that's going to come. That'll be right there. First is, are we going to go ahead and do a bill? And I, I was given all the committee a chance to comment on a bill, and we'll do a straw poll, which I think it's evident we're probably going to write a bill. So, uh, Representative Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And my only comment is, is business want things to be consistent, and they don't want to have uh, surprises. And... Um, Without that consistency or, or they know what's coming up, 
uh, they're going to be hesitant to um, expand or even co continue. So I think that it's important for us to have a, a um, uh, uh, an extension of the sunset. I, I agree with uh, Senator James. I think that we should just get rid of the sunset and then that, that provides even more consistency. If, we've, if we have in the future problems, then we can put a sunset back on there and do other things. But uh, I have refrained from uh, uh, talking about how well um, the, uh, the commission has done or in the conversion. And I would like to add my voice to that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go Chair Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I was to see a simple bill at this point and all the bill would do is uh, remove uh, the sunset. And then uh, you folks that are on the committee uh, in the general session, you're gonna have an opportunity to, to work it and uh, make lots of changes and it'll, it'll get the proper attention uh, doing that. I don't want it too encumbered at this time, Mr. Chairman, I just think it'll just make it more difficult. So just simply drafting a bill that repeals the sunset at this point and going from there, uh, it is, uh, I think, the path forward. Okay. Further comments? Uh, Representative Yen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my, my comments ultimately surround the fact of, of what we want the policy for the future of Wyoming to look like, right? So if we are interested in expanding into skill games in the future or expanding to anything else, then you know, I think getting rid of the sunset date makes sense. Personally, I, I don't think I'm interested in expanding gaming in Wyoming. So if you want consistency around what is the message from the Wyoming legislature of what we want in the future of Wyoming, you know, I think getting rid of the, the, the sunset date or extending the sunset date ultimately says, we're not sure what we want. So we're gonna kick the can down the road at least another year or another, however many set of, uh, however long that we want to do this, because even if we just remove the sunset date, we're still not really saying, oh, so then is that fair to all the people who don't get a chance to put in skill games? Are we going to allow more skill games in the future? Um, so the question is, where does Wyoming want to draw the line? For me, the line is where it is already with our current statute, and I, I'm not super interested in changing it. Um, I do remember when um, we were working this bill during the, the budget session that one of um, our colleagues told me that this is going to result in a lot of lobbying over the interim and during election season. And I, I, I didn't think he was as right as he is right, but he, he was very right. Uh, so if we extend the sunset date, if we get rid of the sunset date, we're, this, this issue isn't gonna be over. Um, we're gonna continue getting lobbied on how we can expand gaming in Wyoming. And um, you know what, I, I, I think we have bigger problems to deal with and it's not something that I really want to continue pursuing. So I'm against doing a new bill, but uh, I'm also interested to hear what the rest of the committee has to say. Thank you. Thank you. Any more comments from the committee? Senator Meniz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, the issue is never going to be over. But in saying that, I, I totally agree with Co-Chairman Miller. Let's deal with the sunset date. The rest of it, uh, trying to do in a Zoom meeting is ridiculous. I give these folks on the new committee an opportunity to work a bill. They're going to get plenty of feedback from everybody that's got a, a, a shoe in the game here. It's, it's going to be a free for all. So trying to do that over a Zoom meeting in the next half day or whatever uh, might be a waste of our time. Let's let the new people deal with it. Let's extend the sunset and get on with it. Thank you. Any further comments? So I'm going to real quick have everybody raise their hand that's in favor of doing a bill draft to deal with the sunset date. And you can bring amendments if you want. We'll vote on them quickly. So, uh, I, I get, yeah, we clearly have enough. So uh, we'll direct staff to do a bill. Uh, I'm not sure how to exactly proceed on the drafting right now is the uh, – concurrence of the committee and I think we'll just uh, treat it as an amendment. Someone can go ahead and say the bill draft is going to be to remove the sunset and we can go ahead and get that started for the base level and then we can dispense with anything else. Co-Chairman Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Uh, Co-Chair. Uh, I move 
that we ask staff to draft a bill that uh, on page seven of 171, line 12, it removed that line. And uh, that's what I would like to see drafted at this point. Is there a second? Second. We have a second on it. Second. Uh, Mr. Brody. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would just ask that LSO be given the latitude to make any conforming amendments uh, that would be necessary. We will. You'll definitely have that. So it's been moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion on bill draft? Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I couldn't hear what the motion was. And I've had to turn off my, uh, uh, my video just to try to get to be able to hear the video. So if the motion can be re repeated, I would appreciate that. Okay, the motion came from Co-Chairman Miller and it was seconded and it literally just removed the sunset out of the correct page or part of the statute on 171. So it would just remove the sunset and do nothing else. It's been moved and seconded and we're just doing discussion on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No discussion, questions called. All in favor, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine in favor. Opposed, raise your hand. One, one, two, three, four. Does that match your numbers, Mr. Brody? I believe so, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So we've passed the bill draft. Is there any amendments proposed to it? No amendments are proposed. So, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Representative Tass, I'm sorry if I missed you. Uh, no, that's fine. I'm, I'm slow. Uh, I would like to see an amendment to include. Uh, the Wyoming Gaming Commission and the support coalition that they have on page 35 and 36. And I don't know quite how that needs to be worded, but uh, I think if you're going to move forward with that, this is a reasonable thing to have attached to the uh, gaming bill. Thank you. Okay, this is for the, the support part of it. Is there a second? Okay, we have a second from Senator Wasberger. Mr. Brody. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just ask if the committee could maybe get a little bit more into the specifics. Um, I'm not sure how low the winning payment can be from a skill-based game, but um, is the intent that, for example, they win $7 on a skill-based game that now they have to um, engage in the process for uh, child support um, that's highlighted on page 36? Perfect. That's a, that's a great one. We will have to set a level with it. Representative Tass, would you like to insert a level that it trips in at? Well, I, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just thinking they said that you already have that in the horse racing uh, uh, legislation, something that would be comparable to what they have. And I don't know what that is. Mr. Brody, can you draft that way? All right. Uh, I can work with the Gaming Commission. Uh, perhaps it would be helpful for the committee if uh, Mr. Moore could maybe um, provide a little context for that. I'm not we will We will direct him to work with you on this bill draft because we, we, we're likely to have one last meeting and this bill draft's gonna have to be done well. So my request would be to allow you to work with, with whoever to meet our intent of the bill. So if that fits Mr. Tass, is the second degree with matching the historic horse racing numbers? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I agree. I think that would be a great thing to do. Um, essentially, what we're doing is copying uh, what's already uh, in statute before. So the, the same amount would be uh, the way to go. Perfect. So we've got that. Any further discussion, Mr. Moore? Thank you, Chairman Driscoll. Um, currently, in the paramutual statutes, we do not I repeat, we do not have the ability to do that. What it is, is it's in the lottery and it's a very simple language with the lottery corporation to be able to transfer that and do it. So I can work with, uh, with Mr. Brody and, and get that to him, but also um, 
to respond to the other questions about the level of that. Um, it's and, and some guidance maybe from you all to uh, Mr. Brody on that would be, you know, it's not practical for anything under five, six thousand dollars, something like that. Um, it, it's very, it's impossible to track is the problem, um, or very difficult if nothing else. You could leave it up to rules and regulations um, if you'd like me to, to do it that way. So that's all I have, thank you. Mr. Brody. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would just point out that um, on page four of House Bill um, 171, the legislature limited the payout for these skill-based amusement games to $3,000. Um, so based on the testimony from Mr. Moore, it sounds like that the games aren't paying out enough to cover perhaps the administration of, um, I guess, conducting such a program. Good catch, Mr. Brody. Uh, Representative Tass, does that uh, affect your motion? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I I, uh, I think these people that are behind on their uh, child support uh, should not win three thousand dollars and and go skipping down the road. I I think they, uh, if you want to need to, uh, anything over a thousand dollars ought to be subjected to. You know, we need something there. I think uh, uh, I think that needs to be addressed and if, uh, you know, anything over a thousand dollar win should be subject to uh, the uh, child support rules. Mr. And Chairman. I, go ahead. I'd have a question for Mr. Moore because he does state that uh, DFS had developed a, a mock portal for wild lotto um, or actually for Paramutual, they developed it for Wild Lotto and the ongoing cost is $30 a month. I just wondered if whatever they have developed for Wild Lotto and for Paramutual, if that would um, naturally be able to be applied to gaming. Mr. Moore. So Representative Flitner, yes, um, thank you for that. Um, the portal would be able to apply across the board. The hardest thing, and, and you would you'll hear a testimony on this. The lower the lower thresholds are just very difficult to to. Tr they're not difficult to track. They're difficult to manage with the child support um, mechanism. Um, it's it's not an issue on our part, on the agency's part. It's more a logistical situation for the operators, and and becomes very difficult. The reason it's worked and it can work very well with the historic racing is we have larger jackpots and with the lottery they have a different function and as far as paying back and also with the historic racing with the larger jackpots it's a different function um, so you know it would just be a situation to where maybe make it to where we could develop the rules and the regulations to to work with that but um, keep it simple in statute would be my suggestion. Thank you. Um, Representative Tass, we're going to have to come up with the final draft. Do you want to leave it to rules and regs or do you want to put a dollar figure on it? Uh, I, I guess I'd like to leave it up to our committee here, but uh, I, uh, I don't want to see rules and regs uh, taken, sweep this under the rug. So uh, yeah, let's say if, uh, anything over $1,000 would be subject to it. Senator yes, Wasberger on second, are you okay with that? I'm okay with that, Mr. Chairman. Um, the question is, uh, further down the road, if paramutual waging is not a part of this, then why isn't it? And if they have bigger jackpots, why aren't we making sure that if you're a winner and you're a behind on your child supports, why doesn't that apply to that also? I'll comment just a little. I think it's a great point. I'm gonna go back to what the co-chairman said when he did the bill. If we start adding lots to this bill, my advice is it's gonna get pretty difficult to get very far with it. Uh, I'm happy with whatever the committee wants to do, but if you wanna, when they were done with this, and if you wanna amend again in the statutes, we can do that or you can do it from the floor, Senator Wasserberger. So 
but we do have an amendment on the floor. It is for $1,000 and to implement the uh, intercept program. Uh, any further comments on for or against on the amendment? All in favor, Co-Chairman Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, I'm gonna vote no on the amendment, not that I'm against what, what uh, the bringers are trying to do is just keep it clean and they're going to have eight opportunities to amend this bill uh, during the general session. So I think there's going to be plenty of opportunities to, to take uh, things like that on uh, for all parties involved. I, I think it's going to get a lot more complicated. So I think just for the general session or for any attachment, let's just have a bill, a committee bill that makes it uh, to committee uh, for general session and then those new committee can work that bill. So not really against, and I won't hurt my feelings if it passes, but, but I will be voting against it. Very good. Further comments? Question being called, everyone in favor of the amendment to add the intercept program at a $1,000 level, please raise your hand. I see one, two, three, four, five. Is that jive with you, Mr. Brody? Chairman, I actually counted six. Six, thank you. I'm not always good at counting. All opposed, raise your hand. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. The amendment has failed. Is that match your count, Mr. Brody? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Amendment has failed. Any further amendments on the bill? Any further amendments? Okay. Question has been called on the bill. The bill is to just remove the sunset dates. We actually referenced 171, but it'll go back to our enrolled act and the statutes is what the staff will track it to. So that'll be a roll call vote. Uh, we'll have Mr. Brody or Mary Beth call the roll, please. Mr. Chairman, this is a roll call vote on a new bill repealing the sunset date. Um, Senator Anselmi Bell. Aye. Senator James. Aye. Senator Moniz. Aye. Senator Wasberger. Aye. Representative Edwards. No. Representative Flitner. No. Representative Freeman. Aye. Representative Haley. Representative Newsom. Aye. Representative Tass. Representative Tass. No. Representative Winter. Aye. Representative Yen. No. Co-Chairman Miller. Aye. Co-Chairman Driscoll. No, sorry. Mr. Chairman, I believe that passed. The bill draft is passed. With that, we're at 1156. We will take a break until one o'clock. And at one o'clock, we'll have Mr. Moore come uh, present on any fixes he may have on 171 that are technical glitches that came out of the Enrolled Act that he feels like needs fixed going into session and anything else anybody from the committee has. So with that, we'll, we'll break till one o'clock.